Hello, son. Being an old man has its perks. I spend most of my time reading all of your comments, and they are unilaterally positive. Thank you for that. You really make my day. In tonight's episode, we'll talk a little about Yosemite and Yellowstone National Park horror stories. Let's go! As a cop, I have a few supernatural encounters to share with you. Not exactly sure how related they are to the supernatural, but I can tell you the night in question it was very hot. Our police radio started going crazy with calls for an officer down in the northern section of the city. We all quickly headed out there to this call. When we arrived, there were already multiple patrol cars at the scene outside this unoccupied warehouse. There was blood all over the ground. One of our officers had been shot in the chest. Luckily for him that his vest had saved him from dying. He was unsteady on his feet and can barely stand up due to how much pain he was in. After getting an ambulance, we sent him off. Once we got his vest off, we could see he had a very bad wound. We later found out that another officer had died at the scene after being shot by a shooter who fled into the warehouse. This leads to my supernatural encounter that I witnessed with one of my fellow partners who went inside. I stayed outside looking for any signs of the suspect, and suddenly all of our radios started going crazy again. Haywire and wacky, but instead of my dispatcher coming over it, it was just crazy amounts of static. This would actually happen to all of us. We would later find out from reporting to each other. After a few more minutes of standing outside doing some searching, I began to hear more radio static and scratchy noises to my radio receiver. Then I began hearing my partner screaming from inside the warehouse. I bolted in, looking for any signs, and all the lights inside the warehouse in unison shut off. I pulled out my mag light and began searching around. I could still hear him screaming upstairs, so I started shouting his name, trying to look for the stairwell. I found it going up the stairs to the third floor, where I'm sure I heard his screams. Now I just need to stop the story here for just a second and explain this story that I'm about to share with you. It doesn't sound like any normal story you'd probably hear. I'm sure you get a lot of stuff, but as an officer I don't ever want to share anything that's so out of the realm of reality that I would get laughed at. So I have to tell you that what I saw next I have no explanation for. I cannot rationalize this or explain it away with normal logic. So as I'm running up there, I entered the third floor and I could still hear screaming. But as I came around the corner, I found a deceased person, which I believe was the shooter. They were unidentified and looked to be like a male in his early thirties. He was in a pool of blood and his weapon was not far from him. I quickly checked to see if he was responsive, but he had no pulse. It was right here after this that I felt this overwhelming sensation of being watched. Although thoroughly checking all around me, there was no signs of anybody, and I could still hear my partner wailing in the distance. It must have been on the next floor, so I quickly run back to the stairwell and run up to the fourth floor. Of course, his screams and wails go completely silent, and I could hear something big moving around on this floor, thinking it was the person probably keeping him quiet or pinned down. Perhaps I drew my gun, yelling out, shining it in every which direction. I didn't see anything or see any blood or signs that anybody would be up here. I kept calling my partner's name, yelling, hoping they would respond. And just then I heard something large coming towards me, approaching me from the side where my view was obstructed. As I turned to respond to the noise, I see this large black figure with pointed ears coming right at me. Out of reaction, I fire and this doesn't stop it. So now I turn and run. I get to the stairwell and this thing is gaining on me. I get down to the stairs and I go down three, two, one, and I'm now on the bottom level. I hear this thing start to come down the stairwell. It is incredibly large, and keep in mind the entire time this has happened. I did not stop to turn around and identify what my sealant was, or who they were from the vague shape that I saw that it came after me. It was not human, nor was it animal. I can't exactly describe what or who it was. I fled out of the warehouse building, turned around, and radioed for dispatch. 
I still could not find my partner, and I needed back up. Now, within three minutes, four to five black SUVs pull up, and about 16 to 20 of these soldiers comes out and began storming the warehouse. They were all black, and they were a branch of military that I did not quite recognize. Several secret agent-looking men surrounded me, telling me that I no longer have jurisdiction over this case, and I need to leave now or risk being detained. I explained to them to show me their badges who they were, and that I was an officer of the county, and that one of my men was. They interrupted me, telling me that I either risk being detained or leave now. So I start arguing with a guy, and my sheriff comes up right behind me, explaining to me that the case is now out of our hands, and we need to let these guys take over. So I pull my shirt to the side, asking who are these guys, what are they doing here, and where is our partner? After shooting down all my questions, he just sends me home without really much information at all. I get that this story is very anticlimactic, but I'm actually hoping that sending this to you, you can give me any sort of hint as to what has happened. Is this normal for anything like this to happen? Did I encounter something from another world? Was this a ghost? And who were these men in the SUVs? Were they some sort of secret military branch, or was this some form of the police that I was never made known about? Any help from your end would be greatly appreciated, since I'm sure this falls under the realm of paranormal. Thank you. I worked the night shift as a park ranger, and I patrol a state park in the south part of the United States. I'm not saying which park. I've been employed as a ranger for nine years and have worked as a lead ranger at several parks. I'm also an avid hiker and have experienced many of the natural wonders this country has to offer. Also, I had the fortune of having witnessed the supernatural a few times during my career, once while I was hiking with my family in the early summer but the other all alone, hiking in the winter, both times in a similar park that I'm currently employed at, but I digress. Let me tell you about what happened to me. It was a few weeks ago I was working on the night shift. My partner had already come in and gotten off work, so I was all alone. I was patrolling the trails and the grounds as was my usual routine. I had just finished patrolling the main trails and had moved on to the smaller trails located further out of the main area of the park. I was in the gorge area of the park named for its narrow, winding trails that lead from the top of the mountain to the bottom. While making my way down to the trail to the bottom, I began to hear an odd noise coming from behind. I could not quite make out what it was at first, but it sounded like a scuffling noise. It was a small trail, and I turned around to see if I could get a look at what was making the noise. I looked behind me, and due to the darkness, could not see anything. I returned down to the walking trail, and the noise again sounded from behind me. I again turned around, and this time I saw it. A black shadow-like figure walking upright on the trail, parallel to me. I was startled by the sight of the figure, and turned around to continue on my way. The noise was again heard behind me, so I turned to get a better look. The figure was still there, but it moved even with me. I could not make out any face or feature of this figure. It was entirely black, no shadows or even staining. I again turned away and began walking in the trail and doing my best to ignore it. The noise again happened behind me, so I turned once more. It was still there, but I could make out this sort of strange figure. However, right near where the shadow was, I saw a separate figure, this one pale and gray, where I could see its face and make out a few features. It was very disturbing. It looked strange. The skin was a pale gray, and the features looked similar to those of a human, but very strange. The mouth was open, and the figure appeared to be making a moaning noise. I stood there staring at this thing for a few seconds with the black shadow figure coming up behind me and then continued to turn coming down my way. It was no longer standing. It was now crouched down and turned its head to look at me. The gray figure in the trees turned away and disappeared. I knew I was in danger from whatever was happening to me, from the shadowy figure that was following me to the gray humanoid figure watching me through the trees. 
Something was going on, and I knew if I did not exit now, my life was in danger. I quickly turned around and made my way back, unaware that this thing might still be following me. After all, I have no idea what it was I encountered. It could have been paranormal. It could have been alien. I'm not sure. I'm sorry my story is so short, but I really am not a good storyteller. So I'll let you summarize this for me. Maybe you can give me some answers as to what I saw and why I was being followed by what. I've been an on-duty officer for eight years now. Here's my story, hands down, one of the most disturbing calls I've answered. It's the one and only, the, the actual one and only call for the story. I received a distress call from my department to check out an anonymous tip about a home with several disturbing signs of maltreatment. When I arrived at the location given by the supposed informant, it's dark outside, and I could see what looked like several lights on in the house. As I stepped out of my car and approached the property, I can feel an immediate temperature drop, as well as a feeling of being watched coming from all around me, but there was nothing visibly suspicious going on, so I continued walking toward the door. The front yard was pretty bare, except for a couple of trees swaying slightly in the wind. No sign of anybody approaching the house. I ring the doorbell. Wait a minute. No response. I try again. Still nothing. At this point, my discomfort is growing exponentially as I notice sounds from inside the house that sound like wild animals. Note, these were not animal noises either, or normal animal noises. My next step is to knock hard on the door, but there's still no signs of life from inside, and it seems everybody in there must be asleep or something, maybe ignoring my knocking. Suddenly these strange noises coming from within stop, and it's eerily quiet again outside. So I duck out of sight under one of the windows near the front porch in case somebody opens up and finds me right at the door. As I look up at the windows to see if one of them might open silently on its own, a shadow darker than the night itself starts moving around in one of the windows. Then it moves to another window, and another, and so on. That's when this woman opens the front door in a small cloak and kind of famished looking. She drops to the ground and starts convulsing with blood pouring out her eyes and mouth. Of course I'm trying to help her, saying, Ma'am, ma'am, are you okay? Calling for backup at 911. And after that, she stops convulsing. I've checked for a pulse. She's dead. I can't even begin to explain what had just happened in front of me and... Suddenly, I'm only maybe two or three feet inside the house. The door behind me slams shut. All the lights go out, and I feel this immense presence of evil surrounding me. And in that moment, I knew I was dealing with some sort of supernatural force. And to make matters worse, I could feel that there was something in the house with me. I get back on my radio, and now it's completely dead, not working at all. I pull out my flashlight. My flashlight is completely dead as well. So I turn around and try and open the door. The door is locked and will not budge. Now I start to shake the handle violently, banging on the door, trying to get it to open. And in that moment I could hear something walking down the hallway towards me. Thud, thud. Something or somebody incredibly large was coming down the hallway. Remember, this home is now pitch black and I'm beginning to get scared like no other. I felt like a little boy lost in a haunted house, and here I am, a grown man of 37, armed to the teeth as any officer is. So I pull up my gun and point it in the direction. I yell loudly who I am and for them to stop. There is a brief pause. Thud, thud, more footsteps coming closer in my direction. I was beginning to get very nervous. I felt that somebody was coming towards me, and with it being so dark, I had no way to see who or what this was. I knew I was in danger. There's another brief pause, and this thing began to walk closer and closer. Now it was probably no more than twenty feet away from me, and the only thing that lay in this dark house between me and whoever was approaching was this dead, cloaked woman on the floor. I said one more time, Stop! I raw fired, thought third, and so I fired off two shots. The light from the bullet showed me what I was shooting at. Surprisingly, 
It was nothing, nothing human for that matter. It was just a large black shape. It was the shape of a human, but I couldn't tell what it was. I immediately turned around after now getting within ten feet of me and pushed the door as hard as I could and opened and I flew out, tumbling out onto the porch in the yard, turning around quickly by standing up and pointing my gun. Nothing I could tell was standing in the doorway, like I thought. It was just pure darkness. I turned back, ran towards my car, got on the radio and called for backup immediately. I told them there was a deceased person inside the house. I ran back to the front yard and pointed my gun completely at the front, open door, expecting whatever was following me in the house to step out. It never did. I kept my aim steady until a couple officers showed up with me. They thought I was going crazy, but I explained to them until they shined their flashlights and only to reveal nothing, and they saw the deceased person. They moved in and were able to get the power working back again after the paramedic showed up and retrieved the body. It seems that all had died down. I have no explanations for what exactly I dealt with inside that house. I have no idea why this small woman, who was very old, was in a dark cloak, and while she randomly convulsed after answering the door and died right there on the ground, and what this entity was that was approaching me from the back side of the house. Is it possible that this house could have been used for witchcraft or summoning of some kind? I know that sounds partially science fiction, or even fictitious, but there is something not right about this house. I was on patrol at night in Ozarks National Park, alongside my colleague, who was also a park ranger. We were chatting as we walked, and he asked me if the gossip about werewolves being real was true. I hesitated for a moment before telling him that, yes, it was true. Even though I decided to make my encounter secret, I needed to tell it to someone. So I told him that had encountered one before in the park during the afternoon. I started my story. It had been a sunny day, and I had decided to take a walk on one of the park's trails. I heard the rustling of leaves and went to investigate. When I got there, I saw the werewolf devouring a deer... It was a terrifying sight. The creature was huge, covered in shaggy fur, and had a face like a snarling animal. I aimed my rifle at it, but it saw me and quickly fled into the woods. So I walked up to the carcass of the deer and saw strange marks all over it. I reported the incident to our supervisor, but he brushed it off and said it was probably just a bear and to keep my mouth shut about it. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. On my next patrol, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched, like the werewolf was still out there, somewhere in the woods. I knew deep down that it was real, and it was still out there. My colleague froze. He thought I was joking. I wasn't. As we continued on our patrol, my colleague and I kept our guard up, constantly scanning the woods for any sign of the werewolf. We were both on edge, knowing that we were in the presence of something much more dangerous than any bear. We didn't see any sign of the werewolf that night, but I knew it was only a matter of time before it would attack again. The next day, I alone decided to take a closer look at the marks on the deer's carcass. I noticed that they were not claw marks, as I had initially thought, but more like bite marks. The bites were large, and it was clear that they were made by a creature with a powerful jaw. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was clear that this was no bear, but a werewolf. I went to my supervisor again and showed him the marks on the deer's carcass. He looked at me with a mixture of fear and disbelief. He ordered me to keep quiet about it and not to talk about it to anyone else. He said that it would cause panic in the park and that it would be bad for the park's reputation. I knew that I had to do something to protect the people in the park, but I didn't know what. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I started researching werewolves and how to protect myself from them. I learned that silver bullets were the only thing that could kill a werewolf, and that they were vulnerable during a full moon. I decided to take my rifle and go into the woods during the next full moon. I knew it was a dangerous decision, but I had to protect the people in the park. That night I walked into the woods with my rifle loaded with silver bullets. I walked for hours, scanning the woods for any sign of the werewolf. 
Suddenly I heard a rustling in the bushes. I aimed my rifle at the source of the noise and shoot. I fired my rifle and the werewolf let out a howl before falling to the ground. I walked up to the creature and saw that it was dead. But unfortunately it wasn't a werewolf. It was a bear. I was out hunting with my dog and two friends in the deep woods when we got separated. I called out for them, but there was no answer. I was completely lost and alone in the dense forest. As I searched for my friends, I heard a strange noise behind me. I turned around, but there was nothing there. I continued walking, but the noise followed me. Suddenly a large creature tackled me to the ground. It was a Bigfoot with fur covering its entire body and glowing eyes that seemed to pierce through me. It snarled and growled, baring its teeth as it tried to attack me. I was terrified and struggled to get away, but the Bigfoot was too strong. Just as it was about to strike, I heard the sound of my friends calling out my name. The Bigfoot fled at the sound of their voices, and I managed to escape. I told my friends what had happened, but they didn't believe me. They thought I'd just gotten lost and was hallucinating. But I knew what I had seen was real, and it would haunt me for the rest of my life. This incident occurred in Memphis, Tennessee. I started my career as a Memphis police officer a few years previously in the 1980s. I was on a special assignment at the time. It was 2 a.m., and it was a clear summer night but quite humid. I was in my personal vehicle with the top down and the radio playing. I was still in my uniform, including my bulletproof vest and a gun belt with all the regular equipment attached to it. I was heading south on Covington Pike at a good rate of speed and was the only one on the road. This part of the road connects the Raleigh Bartlett area to the Burclair area. The road is slightly elevated as the surrounding area is low and running through it is the Wolf River, which is a few miles from here and connects to the Mississippi River. This area is commonly referred to by the locals as the Wolf River Bottoms these days. As I was driving in my peripheral vision over to my right just outside my headlight beams, I noticed something was moving fast directly toward the front of my car. I immediately slammed on the brakes, thinking that a deer was running across the road. But I couldn't have been more wrong. It came to a screeching halt right in the middle of the road, right in front of my headlights, not more than seven feet from my bumper. As we both froze in place staring at each other for several seconds, it appeared to be three to four feet tall, but was also crouched. It could have been closer to five if it stood straight up but I got the impression that its current body posture was its normal way of standing. It had a large head, at least compared to its skinny, slender body. It appeared to be dark gray and greenish in color, similar to the color of an alligator, but the appearance of its skin looked like a similar texture to a human's. It had dark, large oval eyes on each side of the upper part of its face running slanted from the top portion of its head to about the midsection of its head. It was kind of pointing inward to where you would expect a nose to be. However, from what I could tell, there was no distinct nose, at least none like a human. Below the eyes was a very thin, dark, almost black line, which I assumed was its mouth. It ran from about the same location a human's mouth would be, however. The lion ran straight across the lower face in front, and then turned upward and slightly back on the head. It had no ears it could see. Its body and chest area were rounded like a human, but vastly smaller, almost like a child's. Its arms appeared to be longer and somewhat disproportionate to its body, and they were skinny and had an insect-type look to them. I could make out hands, but they were also completely folded at the wrist joint. The legs were long because even with this thing's shortness, I could make out the top of them even with it so close to the bumper, which was obscuring the bottom half somewhat. They were like the arms, thin and insect-like, but appeared to be jointed. I did notice its chest area moving slightly like it was breathing, but it seemed slow and steady. I never noticed anything like genitalia. There was no hair any place that I could see, and I'm not even sure if it was wearing any type of clothing. 
If it was, it would have had to be skin tight. I never noticed a tail at any point. My adrenaline was pumping, and it was only a brief period of observation. It again took off like a shock, and it was out of my headlights. I could still make out its outline in the darkness, and it was moving like a sprinter. It leaped over the guardrail onto the other side of the road and down the embankment. I will admit that this was not the only bizarre incident that I had during my career, but it definitely was the strangest. I never told anyone on the force about the encounter. In fact, I only mentioned it to a close friend during these many years. I can only identify it as a lizard man or an unknown humanoid. I would have never believed it unless I actually witnessed it. I work on an oil rig. My job is to run an excavator and mix off the mud that comes out of the ground and do stuff that needs big machine. Because of the locations of these rigs, I have to drive to pretty remote places in the wilderness of Canada. Anyway, one of the light towers at the edge of the lease went out. I went over and in the forest I could see these weird like fireflies type of things, but like the size of a basketball but they weren't bright like they weren't lighting things up around them. Then I started feeling super uneasy. In between some trees I could see this big-ass silhouette of a person with red glowing eyes. I ran back into the machine just to see it walking away when I was in it. I ended up telling the crew, and I'm not the only one who's seen it. Like half of them have seen it, and two of them have had it smile at them. WTF is this thing. Also, I'm so sorry for the punctuation. Cop here. I had another officer at work meet up with me right after a call he was on. He said an elderly lady was insisting someone was getting into her mobile home and stealing things and moving them around when she was asleep or not home. This is the standard M.O. for dementia calls. They will insist, but the facts don't add up, and after talking to them for a while, you start to realize they aren't all there. Well, she had called us before and was advised by the officer to take some measures to prevent it or disprove it, which she obliged. She screwed all her windows shut, changed the locks on the doors, and installed cameras inside. She even set an alarm with motion detectors in the house and slept in her locked bedroom where she could arm and disarm from there without leaving the bedroom. And she said they were still getting inside the home. So the first thing I think at this part of the story is that it has to be dementia because how the hell would they get in now? That or it's like those horror stories where a person is living in your attic. She has no attic though so that's out. Well, he reviews the video, and you can see her leave and lock the front door. Then, sure as shit, someone's hand can be seen in the edge of one of the frames inside the home. He said after seeing that he tore the place apart inside and out, but there was no way in or out, no signs of forced entry, and nothing missing from the home. He said he ended up not taking a report because he couldn't figure out how to write one without saying it was a ghost. Swiss military here, 18-2 Panzer Division. I racked my head for a while trying to remember if any. Bad things happened during my service, and one finally came to mind. It was during one of my repetition courses. Here you can do something akin to a year or a shorter recruit school, but have to go back every year for a month for a refreshment course. About three or four years ago, I believe. As a tanker, we do three-year rotations between two different training spots, one in Bure for two consequent years, as in a row, not sure if it's the right word, for the pilots to drive on a large terrain, and one in Hinterrhein for us loaders, hooters to practice our firing technique with the tank. So this was the year I was stationed in the Hinterrhein Valley. You can Google map it if you're curious Hinterrhein Schessplatz, if you want a better idea of the layout of the land. Basically, it's a long valley in between mountains and targets at the end of the four kilometer or so length of it. At the entrance of the area, there's a covered hangar where we leave the tanks overnight after service is done on them. Anyhow, it was one of the weekends where my company was to stay on guard duty, and I was, as with all these stories, assigned the night shift between 2 a.m. 
to 6 a.m. with two-hour rotations. For those that aren't familiar with the concept, basically you turn on posts every two hours. Two hours at the guard booth, two hours on the sidelines, but alert, two hours car patrol, rinse, repeat. I was with my colleague Pitch, full name irrelevant, but it's the first letters of his family name, at the guard booth. As it was during the winter period, it was quite chilly, too. Chill, outside, so we just sat inside the booth, occasionally taking a walk around and radio in to base for checkups. Also, since it was nighttime, we were issued NVGs. Since the valley is rather large and not illuminated, they came quite in handy for on foot patrol. While my mate was keeping warm inside, I took advantage of my Russian heritage and braved the outside for a smoke and a quick scan slash patrol of the grounds. With my plus 25 frost resistance, I went on first down the path towards the targets. Down valley, I guess, having my smoke and generally just scanning the area with a flashlight or the NVGs. I then went back down to the booth, circled around the road and into the hangar. Yeah, the hangar. The one filled with a dozen 60-ton war machines and nothing else except a few brooms and dust cloths. Now, to paint one more picture, the hangar is mostly straight, but with a slight curve. The park tanks have about a one-meter gaps between them, and a large three, four-meter gap on the left flank for passage, etc. I was feeling cocky, I guess. I mean, it's Switzerland. We parked and serviced the damn things barely four hours ago. Nothing can go wrong, right? Wrong. I'm used to doing this. I know the sounds they make. I know the sound of a falling tool and can mostly recognize which tool it is well. I know how the air vents that cycle the gases around the hangar sound. I know the dead silence of a night shift when nothing is on, too. However, I'm sure most of you also know that feeling of dead air and dread you get when you feel something is wrong as well. This was just it. I remember passing the furthest door into the hangar, two entries, both ends, and making my way slowly down the hangar up to where we had parked the tanks for the night. Des, when that dead air hit me, it felt wrong. Now, I'm not going to talk of shadow people or seeing things from the corner of my eye. Thank the nine circles I've never yet experienced that, upon reaching the first row of tanks. I know, however, I could hear things. Tools, to be more precise. A click or two of a socket wrench here. A bolt dropped there. I thought it was. Normal, unexpected, but normal. Probably just a tech staying up after hours to fix an urgent issue or some dumbass that left his phone inside the crew compartment and is trying to get it out while on guard. The tanks often break too, so it made sense in a way that someone might be working on it. Since it's dark, I first called out and shone my flashlight around to alert of my presence. Right, so of course now it start giving up turns into the twilight zone. Nothing. Silence. Because of the previously mentioned curve of the hangar, I can't directly see all the way to the end. So what's a trooper to do than to climb one of the tanks and pull on the NVGs to get a cleared idea? Just that, actually. I climb up, clear the turret, and look over down the entire column. Again, nothing. No open turret hatches, no tools laid out. Silence. Except the noises start again. The wrench, the movement of unbolted, swinging armored skirts, the locking lugs of a turret hatch, etc. Except this time further down the line, further away from me, I crept down each hull trying to see something and trying not to break my neck. Knee BGs kind of play with your depth perception, moving from tank to tank, still nothing. I remember quite well the thick feeling of dread and discomfort. Not because of fear, I guess, but mostly of the unlogical, impossible scenario of hearing things that just shouldn't be there. I eventually noped out of the hangar through the other door, having checked every spot in sad room, between and under the tanks, and checked back with my mate. Told him the story, he kind of laughed it off, but refused to go check the hangar himself afterwards. Sorry if it's lackluster, but it always kind of stuck with me, mostly because, as I mentioned, I know how things sound. 
When you've spent five months shooting, loading, cleaning, and servicing the damn things, you just have inner mechanisms that trigger on certain events. This was a one-time thing that I never really mentioned to my superiors, but it definitely was interesting. I was working early one morning on a Wednesday. At that time, I'd been a police officer for a little over ten years. I was in a good mood that morning because I was expecting some potentially good news about an upcoming promotion. In fact, everyone was in a good mood that morning. I was eager to do my job and go home to my family. My day changed dramatically when the phone rang, though. It was an old friend of mine, and she had called me directly. She sounded exhausted and a little incoherent. When I asked her what was going on, she explained that she hadn't been sleeping. We'll call her Megan for this story. Megan told me that she'd been waking up every night from sounds coming from the basement of her house. At first she assumed it was rats or skunks or something, but then she said the previous night. The noises had gotten so loud that she was certain there was a person sleeping in her basement. Reports like that are never good to hear. It's a surprisingly common event where vagrants will break into someone's basement and live there for weeks on end stealing from them and causing all kinds of damage. The real danger is if someone gains access to the main house. Megan lived alone at the time, so I immediately agreed to come over and take a look. I wanted to make sure that whatever was happening in her basement would come to an end. She asked me to come later as she was going to work. It sounds odd, but she wanted me to hear what she was hearing. She said that the sounds never happened in the daytime. So if I came over at night, then perhaps I could catch the person, if it even was a person that was living in her basement. I agreed, but it left me feeling uneasy and concerned all day. That evening, she let me know when she was on her way home, and I went to meet her at her house. She offered to cook me dinner while we waited for the sounds to start back up. I was in an even better mood, as I had learned by that point that I'd gotten the promotion that I was after. So we had a little celebration. At around 10.30, I heard the first sound coming from downstairs. She stopped and told me to press my ear to the door. So I did. I could hear a fair amount of shuffling. It wasn't very clear what it was, but it was definitely too big to be a rat or a skunk. I told her that I was going to slowly open the door. But when I did, it made a loud sound that I could hear crashing in the basement. I ran down the stairs with my weapon drawn, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I switched the light on. What I found was what looked like a large nest of some kind. There were branches and feathers and dried leaves all piled together in the center of the room, and it stank like nothing I'd ever smelled before. The window was broken, so whoever it was had left. I told her to stay at my house for a few nights and then arranged for some trail cams to be put up in the basement so that we could catch whoever was down there and have sufficient evidence. After a few days, I went to retrieve the trail cams and watch the footage. Megan was sitting next to me at the time. What I saw completely blew my mind. A large animal with long, thin arms and legs climbed in through the window. It behaved similar to a large ape, only I'd never seen an ape like that before. It brought with it more items to add to the nest. I know for a fact that apes don't make nests. In fact, most animals of that size don't make nests. It walked on its two hind legs like a human, but was hunched over the entire time. It had a large rib cage and large ape-like hands, but I remember noting that it had no ears and seemed to have no color on its skin, apart from one large black spot on the back of its head. Megan was freaking out and asking me what to do. I had no answer, for I'd never encountered anything like that before. So I gave the footage to my superior. When he watched it, his eyes stretched wide. The next thing I knew, I had a non-disclosure agreement on my desk, and the footage was confiscated from my possession. Megan was also forced to sign so that she couldn't speak of it. She said that men with suits had come into her basement, and when they were done, there was nothing left, and her entire basement had been boarded up. She never really felt safe in her home, though, and wound up selling it a few months later.
It was a sad day as that home had been in her family for generations, but whatever security she once felt there had been stripped away by whatever creature had decided to nest there. I was a ranger in St. Louis County, Minnesota. The year was 2007. A man in our staff went missing during his lunch break. He was a husband and father. We sent a search party out to locate him. We searched the area for about a day or so, but he was nowhere to be found. We even made inquiries to other nearby towns, but they had no information. We assumed he had wandered away from the area and may have perished. The family of this man requested his remains be found and buried. We honored this request. We had several months go by, and we put this man behind us. Then a strange occurrence happened one early evening in the fall. I was out on patrol, running radar on the roads. I was about two miles north of town, which is a rural area. I was doing my rounds, and I spotted a pair of eyes in the ditch. I thought it was a fox or something. I stopped my vehicle, stepped out. I wasn't expecting what I saw next. A dark, shadowy figure became now visible. It was hunched over, finishing off a deer. This deer was a simple four-point buck. The thing had just been killed and was eating it. That's not all. I was shocked at what followed. It stood back up, this thing on two legs, walking upright. It looked me in the eyes and quickly disappeared. The eyes were blood red. I watched this thing walk off into a nearby creek and disappeared immediately. I went back to the office and called my boss and told him when I saw him. He told me to stay there until he could get there. So I sat there staying in the office while my boss and another ranger wrote down everything they could about what I had to say. They searched for a few hours but could not find anything. I was scared to go out on patrol the next few days. It only happened one or two more times after this. And even then, that's probably too much. I ended up seeing it again in the area where I first saw it. It never acted aggressive, but it was always in that area. The final time it was winter and there was about 12 inches of snow on the ground. I saw it again. This was the last time. I was relieved when the spring came and I did not have to patrol that section any longer. Now, before I end my story... Let me quickly tell you why I included the first part about the man missing after lunch. I believe that his spirit became disembodied and turned into this horrible, ghastly apparition that I saw, or otherwise known as a Wendigo. I believe that it's possible that his spirit, or him dying, turned into this creature that I saw. Of course, this is just a wild theory, but I cling to it because it makes sense to me. I would love to hear any comments or thoughts or even theories on what they think. Do you believe that he turned into a Wendigo? Is it possible that he died and his spirit was able to manifest as this being? I don't know. I worked as a police officer in the town of Nakagoshi's for around eight years. I loved it there. A lot of people don't see why I enjoyed it so much, but that town had really brought me peace after many rough years. That peace was completely disrupted one day, though. There are many trails in Nakagoshi's. Most of them are completely tucked away in thick trees and brush. It was my day off, and walking those trails was one of my favorite things to do. At the time I had been divorced, I'm ashamed to admit that I wasn't a very good father in those years. I hadn't seen my children in years, and I had made very little effort to be part of their lives. It's a terrible thing to admit to, and I have many regrets, but that's the kind of man I was at the time. I had picked out my trail for the day. It was one that I hadn't walked yet, and I decided I'd go exploring. For some reason that day my children were on my mind, I remember that it bothered me because it made me feel guilty. It was kind of a bummer. To feel that guilt on my day off. In hindsight, I was probably thinking about them because some part of me knew that I was in imminent danger. The first thing I noticed was that the trail was very quiet, seemed unusual. Normally, I'd come across at least one other person while on my walks. That day, I hadn't seen a single other soul. 
It didn't bother me too much, but it did tell me that I needed to be more vigilant for snakes and other dangerous creatures. I had stopped for a drink of water, and I was leaning against the wooden rail that lined the trail, when all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I hate that feeling so much. I don't really know why it happens to us, but it's never a good sign. I lowered my water bottle and listened carefully for any kinds of sound. I couldn't hear anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly the space around me felt way too quiet. I looked toward the direction I was going as I contemplated whether or not I should carry on with the trail or head back towards my car. I made the logical decision to head back towards my car. It wasn't far along the trail, so I knew it wouldn't take long to get to safety. As I walked, the only sound I could hear was the sound of my own footsteps, and it completely unsettled me. Then, something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a light thudding sound, and it was coming from high up in the trees. I stopped to look. I scanned the trees, but heard and saw nothing. I decided to stay where I was for just a moment and listen. Then I heard the thought again, just to my left. It was as if something had landed in the tree. I looked up at the tree, which was covered in red and orange leaves. I focused hard on the leaves, searching for a large bird or maybe a squirrel. Then slow movement caught my eye. Something massive was stalking me. I couldn't see it clearly, but it had long limbs and it climbed through the branches sideways. It seemed to be keeping me in its sights as it moved gently through the leaves, barely rustling the branches. Then I saw part of its face. Two saucer-like eyes stared at me from between the branches. It seemed like minutes that we stared at each other. Not once did the creature blink. It seemed to be patiently waiting for me to look away. I was frozen with fear. I could hear nothing but the sound of my heart beating in my chest. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, more hikers stumbled upon me. They were noisier than I was. They had a Bluetooth speaker that was pumping loud hip-hop music, and they were laughing and joking. It scared the creature away. It took off along the trees, moving faster than any animal I had seen before. Those other hikers will never know that their obnoxious behavior had saved my life that day. All I remember thinking was that I was going to die without ever seeing my children grow up. As soon as I got back to my car, I phoned my kids. That experience changed my life for the better. Still, I never want to be that scared again. It was a typical morning in Yellowstone National Park when the body of park ranger John was found. He had been on patrol the night before, but never returned to his post. The other rangers searched for him and eventually found him in a remote area of the park. But something was off. John's skull was missing, and his body had been brutally attacked. My name is Jack, and I'm one of the park rangers. I was tasked with analyzing the body and trying to figure out what could have caused such a gruesome death. As I examined the wounds, I couldn't help but think that they looked like they had been made by a large, sharp claw. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a creature similar to Bigfoot. I shared my findings with the rest of the park rangers, but they mocked me and said I was just seeing things. They reported the case as a murder to the police, but they said they were too busy to investigate. I was left alone with a body, and I knew I had to find out the truth. I decided to take matters into my own hands and ventured into the woods. I wanted to see if I could find any clues or evidence that would support my theory. As I walked deeper into the forest, I heard a loud roar in the distance. I froze in place, unsure of what to do. But then I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was covered in fur had a large, sharp claw, and stood at least eight feet tall. The creature roared again, and a buck ran past me, panicked. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like something out of a nightmare. The creature then fled into the woods, and I was left standing there, in shock. I knew I had to tell the others what I had seen, but I didn't know if they would believe me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I eventually made it back to the ranger station and I told them everything. But they still didn't believe me. They thought I was just seeing things, or that I was losing my mind. I was left feeling alone and isolated.
knew there was a creature out there that had killed John, and I was the only one who knew about it. I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there watching me. I knew I had to be careful, and I couldn't let my guard down. I was determined to find the truth and bring justice for John, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that followed me, knowing that I was the only one who knew the true horror that lurked in the woods of Yellowstone National Park. I'm a Coast Guard, old Navy tug brought into service to the SDS Creeker had a ghost of a Navy guy who died in the bilge from gas. Fast forward to a new used mechanic trying to fix one of the batteries and wasn't getting it quite right. A guy on the batter next to him said, No, you do it like this, and unscrewed a part, showing him how it was done. However, the other guy was in a Navy uniform, and we were at sea. He diapered shortly after talking. Lots of us had seen that Navy engineer in the past, but that particular coast eye got off the boat at the next port call and refused to reboard. We left without him, not sure whatever happened, but he never came back to the ship. We also had the screams of a lady that would happen during late shifts, enough that we always turned the boats aft away from the direction of the screams in case it was a civilian in the water. No woman aboard this ship. We would light up that section of ocean with high-powered lighting, but there was never anything there. We were told not to log the events. One time we paddled into a backcountry site that we like camping at in the fall. It's high on a rocky cliff, but has natural stairs up, so it's nicely protected from the wind and damp of the lake. One day we were walking around in the woods behind the site just to see what we see. There are lots of open spaces caused by exposed rock that create a natural trail. We weren't even that far from the site. All of a sudden we hear a short, low growl. We freeze. Neither of us were sure we actually heard it. We wait a minute, see and hear nothing, so we start walking again. A longer growl. Now the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. My instinct is to run, but I don't want to activate some animal's prey drive. We still don't see anything. My husband picks up a big stick and starts hitting trees and making lots of noise so we seem big. We slowly back away and walk calmly back to our campsite. Needless to say, we didn't sleep much that night. We never saw what it was, but our theory is that it was a coyote. We often hear them howling and yipping near there, and I've read they sleep in the open during the day. We pull into a state park campground to camp for a couple of nights. There was a line of trees separating our campsite from our neighbors, and our neighbors had a strap strung up between two of the trees with two blackened sausages hanging from hooks. Trying to ignore how weird that is, our neighbors greet us and say, Don't worry about the sausages. Our buddy got a trail camera, so we're trying to catch raccoons with it. Glossing over the fact that this trail cam was pointed right into our campsite. I definitely had to keep this in mind when I got out of my camper to pee in the middle of the night. The sausages were still there the next morning. But I think eventually a ranger came by and told them to cut it out because they disappeared sometime during the day. I didn't like the weird vibes emanating from that spot, so we just ignored their presence for the most part. They were gone for most of the day, but came back to their enormous RV and generator right as we were thinking it would be peacefully quiet for the rest of the evening. The last morning, I wake up to the sound of a thousand crows circling us. I lay there for a while and then peek out and see a dead crow lying right in the same precise spot below where those black sausages had been hanging the day before. Every crow within a 100-mile radius was circling overhead, angrily cawing out during this crow funeral. Now, I've been on the wrong side of a crow war before, so I wasn't too interested in any of them recognizing me. We packed up our camp as quickly as we could and hit the road. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story.
This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes. So let's say about 10, 45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with a warm summer nighttime breeze. Car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat so I could really speed. And that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees almost back the way I head came. Then, in exactly half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel than it would be a waste, as I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where all this went down. A house had recently been built there. Two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house, and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe this is all related. Week 1. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and have even met a one-slash-fourth wolf in person. They looked different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I, I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick towards me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two. I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolfy buddy, hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity. My reality and possibility of eldritch terrors, as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its 
body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulked to them and looked equipped for running with back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot, maybe more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. Then I realized... It's going to look at me, it's going to see me, and there is no avoiding it. Panic, terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up or I'd be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. F me, I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But now I realize that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning towards me, and I had let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first, and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then I put my gas pedal to the floor. Gravel road be damned. I thought I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I've already seen too much. My tires had found grip, and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick I've mentioned in one of my other stories to tap my brake soft enough the light comes on, but I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 100 nanium, which is as fast as I can go, before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, no one was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him. Then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There's many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back, he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded, so as we got closer and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic of getting near the place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point he stopped the car. Spooky, you have to see this, he said. No, I whined, resisting him, pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted to get out of here. 
while I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, or even interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnout houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it, a thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans, yet still I saw it. If you've heard of something that matches its description, let me know. So when I was in high school, my friends and I were into really spooky shit that we had no business messing around with. We would visit cemeteries at night, go to our small town's local haunt spot, to try to stir up any urban legends. But the story I'm about to tell made us quit cold turkey trying to seek out the paranormal. One night, we were over at our friend's century-old home. I mean, it was old and creaky and the perfect setting for a night of Oija. We brought it out, and for the first half hour, nothing insane happened. Just some movement from the planchette. Then, feeling smug, I asked the spirits what my middle name was. The thing is, my middle name is literally made up by my parents. It's not a real name. No one in the circle knew, let alone could spell my middle name. There was literally no way someone could even guess it. But the board knew. It spelled my middle name perfectly, and I could feel my heart fall into my gut. Keep in mind, my hands were not on the planchette, so I couldn't have moved it myself. Everyone laughed, because what a silly middle name that would be. But I had to confess that it was mine, and the color drained from everyone's face. All of a sudden, a glass ashtray that was sitting a few feet away on the coffee table split clean in two, and we were done. We left the house to go stay somewhere else. I walk outside. It's the kind of dark when it's too early for morning still, but too late for night and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans were located on the side of the house in the backyard, halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk. When I look over towards the gate, that's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes but it was the most smooth and round head I've seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape, the same height of the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and to the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was fourteen at the time and just stood there waiting for more movement or sound. After about one minute, yeah, I waited. Of not hearing anything, I sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. So to start off, I grew up on a small farm surrounded by forest. It's a small town below a major city in Appalachia. The first incident with this entity was probably when I was maybe 8-10, so 10-13 years ago. I was in my bedroom at home listening to music and playing. My window was open and it was evening getting dark, but I could still see outside. I noticed my dad walking by the window stone-faced. I was going to say hello to him, but decided not to. Later, I mentioned to my mom that I saw Dad pass my window. 
She informs me that my dad wasn't home. In any way, my window was too high up for my dad to have been at that height. Mom decides it was probably a bear. We had a lot of hunting dogs that very often would freak out over nothing, but at the time of seeing what I thought was my dad, they weren't upset. I've mentioned this to my significant other before, and my friends and I were talking about our strangest moments, and significant other tells me to tell them that story, but then tells me he saw something similar when we were visiting my dad in his peripherals. He said it looked like a very tall person, but didn't see specific details, but that it walked past the large kitchen window. He meant to tell me earlier, but honestly forgot. It's really weird, and... I'm not sure what else to think about it, but since my significant other told me he saw it too, I've been trying to research what it might be. I've also just felt creeped out at the thought of going to my dad's again. I've had other weird experiences that I'm not sure what to think of, such as going hiking and finding small shacks in the middle of the woods that are my dad's property, then not finding them again and my mother calling me from outside while I was playing and telling me she heard screaming, thinking. It was me and couldn't see me in the yard and thought a wild animal could have grabbed me. Not sure if they're related, but figured I'd add that. I'd been working a lot of late nights, and it was my first night at home in a while. Where I live is a little remote, which I absolutely love. Or I did love it, until one night when something happened that made me realize that what I thought was a peaceful space could potentially be far from it. On my night off, I decided to walk my dog. It was a nice wind, still night. One of those where it's the perfect temperature and I was able to walk in my shorts and t-shirt. Granted, as a police officer, I've experienced a small amount of unexplained occurrences. The truth is most of us have. I'm kind of glad that I found this channel because even though we're told not to talk about it, I really want someone to know what's going on. We're told not to talk about it because they don't want the public to be concerned about things that the police force cannot possibly have any control over, but I disagree. I think people should know because that way we can all take certain steps to be safer. So that night I was walking my dog along our usual route when he suddenly stopped and didn't want to go any further. It was strange behavior. I tugged at him a little, but he just whimpered and tried to pull me back the other way. I stopped to pet him and make sure that he was all right. I was worried that perhaps he was sick or something. That's when he started growling into the bushes slightly ahead of us. He seemed to have his eyes fixated on something. His growling quickly turned to panic barks and then into yelping. He was clearly terrified. Now I'll protect my dog at all costs. I live far from my family. I'm not married and I have no kids. My dog is my entire life. So immediately I became defensive. I stood in front of my dog and stared at the space where he was staring. I didn't want to immediately turn around at risk of us being attacked from behind. At this point I'm expecting to see a snake or another human or something. When my eyes finally focused into the darkness... My fight or flight kicked in. I only saw the thing for about a second before I bolted back in the direction of home. My dog eagerly running at my side. As I said, it was only a second, but what I saw was like a large coyote. Only it seemed to have eyes like a human. Through the bushes, I could see that it looked like it had mismatched legs. I know that makes no sense, but that's the best I can describe it. I just remember the pure sensation of dread that fell over me. My blood ran cold and my heart rate spiked. I've never run from danger as a cop I'm trained to manage it. But I knew within a second that I was not trained to manage whatever the heck that was. As my dog and I ran away, I could hear the heavy footsteps of whatever it was also running. Only the footsteps weren't behind us. They were alongside us. I've spent the last few weeks looking for somewhere new to live. I can't shake the feeling that the creature could have easily killed us. It had kept up with speed for a few minutes before it slowed down and backed off. I don't know why it didn't attack us. I find that thought surprisingly even more unsettling. Now I drive a fair distance so that I can walk my dog on a different path, and I never walk him at night anymore. 
I shudder to think what might have happened to us if we'd stayed there even a minute longer. Out of all the unexplained events that I've witnessed, that one was by far the most terrifying. I can tell you from experience that the supernatural things you do see are a lot more terrifying than the supernatural things you don't see. I don't know if what I saw was truly supernatural, but it's the only way that I can compartmentalize it. If that thing, that creature, is in fact natural, and I don't want to be part of this existence anymore. Sometimes my dog likes to bark at squirrels or other dogs that pass the house. Every time he barks, I panic thinking that maybe it's that thing just waiting outside for us. I know it sounds ridiculous, but as I said, I've never felt fear like that before. It was just after sunset in summer of 2014. I was traveling on a remote road in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park near Brecksville, Ohio. It's close to the Akron slash Cleveland area. I'd gotten off work early and decided to head home before the evening rush. As I was driving through the park, I noticed movement alongside the road. It looked like a deer grazing along the side, so I slowed down as I approached it. I love hunting. But I also love seeing them. What I saw that day was nothing like a deer. I stopped my car to get a closer look because it looked different than a deer. It was leaning against a tree. I was about 20 yards away from it when I first saw it. I was awestruck by how large it was, easily over six to seven feet tall. But I couldn't tell its color due to the dark. It just kind of looked like a large shadow, which is why I originally thought it was a deer. But as I looked closer, I thought it might be a person in a ghillie suit. That made no sense, though, because it was in the middle of nowhere, and there was a no-hunting rule. So I was perplexed. I got out of my car to investigate further. As I walked closer, I noticed a foul smell in the air. It was a mix of vomit and excrement. I assumed maybe it was a dead deer nearby or something. And it was dark. I shone my light on this animal, and it appeared to be actually eating a dead deer, ripping deer into pieces. I could not see the head of the deer, and I quickly recognized that this wasn't a dog or anything else. It was not a bear or a deer. I was filled with fear. What I saw was reminiscent to that of a werewolf. I ran back to my car and gunned it. I never looked back. I've done my research, and one theory is that it's a wendigo. I don't know about that, though. I do know that it was not a dog, bear, deer, or certainly it was not a person. I was stationed at a rather small police station in one of the more impoverished cities. This would serve as a district for people who had just moved into our county and due to job availability or even family reasons. It wasn't exactly someone would call exciting, but I did not have any qualms with it. I didn't really want any trouble with it or anything major happening there. The way I could help all my fellow comrades out while doing my work behind the scenes without having to deal with traffickers or killers after being in several other districts before that. The station in which I worked at was the center of town near the police department. You could see if you were turned around while standing in front of the building if anything big ever happened. We would help each other out. Everybody had different assignments like be cops, detectives, and law enforcement agencies, and agencies all to make sure that everybody got their jobs done without any hassles or violence. The city was pretty dangerous when I first moved into it, but thanks to us working together as one big family, there were less incidents than when I first started. One night, though, everything changed when our team decided to go after what they thought was a math house on the other side of town. My old station was a good distance away, so I did not hear the gunshots to the radio or anything. But when I got a hold of my captain, he told me to get down there since they left behind an injured officer after supposedly being attacked by what looked like some sort of strange animal. Upon arriving at the scene, our team was nowhere in sight. Even though all that was left behind were trails of blood leading into an alleyway on one side, backing into a forest. Looking around only gave us more questions than answers. 
seeing as how there weren't any bodies or officers anywhere near where we came in, which made it hard for us. I mean, we couldn't start searching for them in case anything bad had happened. After spending a good amount of time looking through the forest, I decided to head back to my station since it was nightfall and I wouldn't be able to do anything else at that moment. Not much changed around our city, even if there were rumors about packs of all animals running around in the outskirts of town until they met up with other people. Thinking back now, maybe it wasn't such a great idea for me to go out there alone after all, but I just wanted to see if everything else settled down by then, which we all knew how that turned out. Walking along the sidewalk during night time is always nerve-wracking, no matter how many times you've done so in the past. You never know when something can happen, but I was lucky that night since nothing seemed to bother me at all. Every so often you could hear cars driving by and people passing by in either direction. For the most part, there wasn't really anything out of the ordinary. After getting off the main road and onto a more quiet street, I began to hear wrestling sounds coming from the nearby bushes. This made me walk a little faster than usual since I didn't want anything catching up with me. Not long after that, however, I heard footsteps directly behind me, and for whatever reason, it felt like something was watching my every move, like if you ever saw the movie Silence of the Lambs, where you could tell that something was right behind you, even though you couldn't see it. By this time, I began to get freaked out, so I started to run while trying to find somewhere safe from whatever might be stalking me. Out of all places, however, I run straight into this dark alleyway. No street lights and nothing, and my heart is racing, feeling like I had nowhere to go. I kept walking further and further until it felt like something was breathing on my neck. I guess that's when the effects of adrenaline fully kicked in, and it felt like an eternity before anything finally happened. Out of all things, I hear this little rumbling noise which was coming from where the rustling sounds were right behind me. Terrified after seeing what looked like some kind of dog or wolf-like creature in the shadows, I turned around, but by then it was too late. It pounced on me, bent down hard on my shoulder. I didn't know how I was able to do it, but once the creature let go, I ran as fast as I could, even though my shoulder felt like it was on fire and blood was oozing down. I'm sure muscles were torn, but I was pumped so full of adrenaline, I think it was blocking a lot of the pain. I got back to our station, and right after opening the door and running inside, my captain quickly saw, and I lost consciousness. I don't really have an answer for what occurred that day, but I can tell you now it was more real than the worst nightmare I've ever had. I had always known that there was something strange lurking in the woods. As a young boy, I had heard the tales of strange creatures and bizarre sightings from the old timers in the small town, nestled in the mountains. But as I grew older and took on the role of park ranger, I began to see things with my own eyes. Creatures that couldn't be explained by science or folklore. Cryptids. At first I tried to brush it off as my imagination or the product of an overactive mind. But the sightings became more frequent and I couldn't ignore them any longer. I knew that I had to tell someone to share the truth about these mysterious beings. So I confided in my supervisor, a grizzled old ranger, Tom, my father's friend, who had been on the job for decades. But to my surprise, Tom already knew about the cryptids. In fact, he had known about them for years and had been sworn to secrecy by the government. Yes, you heard that right, by the Biden administration. I was shocked and confused. How could the government be keeping the existence of these creatures a secret? And why? Tom wouldn't give me any answers, only warning me to keep quiet and not to tell anyone else about what I had seen. But I couldn't just sit back and do nothing. I knew that the public had a right to know about the creatures living in deep woods. So uh, I made the decision to go public with the information. At first, no one believed me. The local media laughed at my claims, dismissing them as the ramblings of a crazy park ranger. They said I'm crazy. I also tried to Google my name. It doesn't show anything. 
Also, why didn't major mainstream media share the article that local media posted? Later I found out. The government was not amused. They probably saw me as a threat, someone who could potentially expose their secrets and undermine their authority. And so, they began to hunt me. I'm not joking. Two men in black came to my house. Before they knocked, I escaped through the rear window. I knew that I had to go into hiding and fast. I fled into the deep woods, hoping to lose myself in the wilderness and avoid capture. As I wandered deeper into the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I heard strange noises in the underbrush, and every so often I caught a glimpse of something moving just out of the corner of my eye. And then, one night, I saw it. A creature unlike any I had ever seen before. It was tall and lanky, with long, sinewy limbs and a face that seemed to be half human and half animal. I froze, unsure of what to do. As I stood there staring at the creature, two men in a black suit appeared out of nowhere. I could see the glint of a weapon in their hands, and I knew that I was in trouble. The two men in black seemed to be working together, trying to subdue the beast. My survival instincts kicked in, and I turned and ran. I could hear the man, but also the creature chasing after me. But I didn't look back. I just kept running, pushing myself to the limit. Finally, I burst out of the woods and into the clearing, panting and sweating. I had no idea where I was or how far I had run, but I didn't care. I was just grateful to be alive. As I collapsed to the ground, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden in the depths of the forest. This story happened to a friend of mine. I share it here with his permission. My friend described what he experienced as follows. Year 1986. There were no electricity or road in the village. The villagers had to go to Alasig, a city of Turkey, to meet their needs. The road to the center was two three km from the village. It was necessary to be on this road at 4.30 a.m. to reach Alasig. There was only one car that goes to Alasig. The car was coming back like noon. The road used to go to Elazig was called Kinderasi, Mine Creek, by the villagers, and they thought that strange events were happening there, and that it wasn't auspicious. Me and two of my friends started preparing at 3 p.m. to hit the road. The road we had to cross that included the A. Demon Creeks to reach Elazig was on our minds. First, we planned to cross the ridgeway, then the Demon Creeks, and enter the highway that leads to Elazig. Afterwards, we hit the road. We lighted our cigarettes while being in a deep conservation. It was utter darkness. There wasn't even moonlight. We were slowly encouraging ourselves to cross the Ed Demon Creeks and thinking about that moment. We were getting close to the Ed Demon Creeks, but first we had to cross the ridgeway. The path was so narrow that two people could not walk side by side, and it was filled with big bushes. We were moving in a single line. I was the last one in the row. The first guy in the row named Kamal suddenly stopped, and he mentioned that there was a black dog watched us without moving on the way. I thought to myself, it's one of our village dogs. My friends were very nervous. We were getting more scared of the stories that we had heard since our childhood. I was scared and started reciting Bismillah. In a Muslim pray, the dog suddenly got out of the way and disappeared after moving a few meters away in the bushes. After the dog had disappeared, we thought to ourselves what the dog was doing there and continued to walk. After walking for one to two minutes, Kamal suddenly stopped again and yelled, It's the same dog again, his sand before moving a few steps back. Three of us didn't know what to do because of confusion and fear. The dog was looking at us again. I recited Bismillah again. The dog stood up and vanished again at the bushes. My friend said, Hassan, let's go back and don't go there. And I said, we need to cross this road. If we don't, we will have to tomorrow. We will use this road for shopping and calm them down. Then we continued to our path. My friends were scared. Of course do I. We were talking about why did the dog appear at us again. 
I tried to calm them down by saying it's just a common dog and following us. We continued to our path. We couldn't believe our eyes what we had seen after three five minutes. A coal black goat was standing on the road like blocking the way. We were so scared. We started to pray and recite Bismillah. The goat suddenly disappeared. Disappearing of the goat made me comprehend that these events weren't ordinary at all, and we got scared seriously, but going back was unnecessary. I calmed my nerves and went to the first row of the line, and I backed my friends. I was both praying and continuing our route. It was only a sharp corner left for the Demon Creek. We were shocked when we finished crossing the sharp corner. What we had seen was indescribable. Long, white as snow, shining silhouette, shaped mass. Whatever, it was obvious that it had arms and legs, but its face was ambiguous, and so it started to create sounds of rumble, scream, crying. We closed our ears with our hands. We were throwing ourselves out of fear and flapping on the ground. In the same time, there was blindly shining. I started to recite my known prayers. My friends were yelling, cursing, and they didn't know what they were doing. I was thinking about how to escape this situation and staying calm. I dragged my friends out of that incident. The screaming voices turned into laughter while we were escaping from there. The laughter echoed in our minds. We head back to the village, but we didn't know how we could come back. At the entrance of the village, there was the house of Kamal. When Kamal's parents saw us, they couldn't believe their eyes. They said, what's the matter with you? You have paleness in your face. We couldn't speak trembling continuously, make noises like dummies. They informed our relatives. They also came here. They tried to grasp with the mind the situation. I rest for a while and drank some water and told them the story. The villagers were stunned. They told us to thank God that you could come in one piece. We thought that we saved ourselves, but from sunrise to sunset for 40 days, we had heavy headaches. Skin rash huge herpes in our lips. Maybe five years ago, one night, I was at a friend's house out in the country in Vesper. Why, when my friend's car turned in and came rushing up the driveway, the car came to a halt and two of my other friends jumped out. They explained that they had seen something they just couldn't describe. I asked them if they got a good look at whatever had them so shook up. They looked at each other and said yes. They said they were driving through the country on their way to join us and were driving past a farm when they noticed something in the ditch. The friend who was driving said he flashed his brights to get a better look, and whatever it was raised up and ran across the road on all fours. It looked like it could walk on two legs if it wanted to, they both said. They also said it looked like it was half dog, half man, or maybe half dog and half monkey. They couldn't explain how the creature looked any better than that. They just kept trying to compare it to other animals. They said they were about 20 yards from it. The brights were on, and they got a good look at it. Well, that's the story. I'll never forget how stricken their faces were with panic and fear. I don't think they were lying. It was July 2004. Three of my friends and I were out in the field, just having a good time, messing around. That's when we heard some noises off in a field a couple hundred yards away. We didn't think too much of it. A little while later, we kept hearing the noises getting louder. We could also hear trees breaking and things like that. We tried to ignore it, but we soon found out that ignoring those sounds was a bad idea. We saw a creature that was seven to eight feet tall coming toward us. The creature stood like a human and acted as a human would, but it looked like a dog or a wolf. We were completely surprised. We had no idea what was going on. We ran back to our cars as fast as we could and drove away. I'm a skeptic of the supernatural, but I believe anything is possible. I won't discount supernatural occurrences if I can't find a logical explanation for them. I've experienced a few incidents I couldn't explain, but I'm going to tell you about the one that freaked me out the most, though. So here it goes. 
I live in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, USA. A lot of people in the cities have cabins in either northern Minnesota or rural Wisconsin. Our cabin was in rural Wisconsin in a small town called Danbury. The cabin is on Long Lake at the very end of Long Lake, Rock. Along with the cabin came almost an acre of land covered by thick forest. We carved a trail through the land for a TVs and whatnot. So, the scene is set. Now, about me. I'm an outdoor enthusiast and have been forever. I'm six feet four fit and have been a hunter since I was like 12. I know my environment, the wildlife, and the forest well, and I'm typically comfortable in the woods. I come from a military family and am trained in multiple forms of combat, armed and unarmed. I also have extensive firearms training and, as a result, am fairly confident in my ability to defend myself. I'm not really scared of people. Big predators, on the other hand, like bears, wolves, man, bear, pig, whatever. I'm not a big fan of. This brings me to the weirdness. I'm 23 now, but at the time of the incident I was 16. Even at 16 I was a decent hunter and had good common sense. Anyway, I was at the cabin with my cousin and grandparents. It was the middle of summer, I think July, with hot temps and whatnot. My cousin and I were shooting at each other with airsoft guns. We had a full-on battle going on throughout the property, including the woods, which were my stalking grounds. I was wearing my bidus with face cover and all, as well as head to two kukimo. Our battle ended up about 100 yards northwest of the cabin, into the woods. We ended the war on the main trail and were standing and talking about the events that had transpired. I was still on guard because I always am. I suppose I could be considered to be a tad paranoid. All right. So we were standing there talking when I noticed something move at our 12 o'clock, about 50 meters out. I got quiet and focused dead ahead, scanning. My cousin was still talking, so I whispered, shut, so I whispered, shut. I figured the movement I had seen was just a bird or something. As a joke and to freak him out, I told him we were being watched. That's when I noticed that the woods were dead quiet. No birds were chirping. There was no sound. That's when I started to think, this only happens when a big predator is around. So, I started looking even closer. That's when I saw it. At my twelve o'clock there was this large animal. It had reddish brown fur and almost blended in perfectly until I focused on it. It had long front limbs, arm-like with what appeared to be formidable claws, and it was standing kind of slouched down against a tree like it was trying to be stealthy, even though it was standing like that. It was nearly as tall as me. The only reason why I saw it was because of its teeth. I think it was panning because its whitish teeth were visible. Its snout appeared to be a tad elongated. I couldn't get a better look because my first thought was, we have to go. I even said it out loud. My cousin was already freaked. When I said those words, he bolted up the trail towards the cabin. He nearly left me in the dust because instead of running when he did, I waited a good three seconds I was being protective of him, keeping my eye on it until I saw it move. It was fast. Woo. That's when I ran like hell. I didn't see which way it ran. All I know is that I heard it crashing through the woods. My cousin stopped at the shed which was still 50 meters from the cabin, to wait for me. When I caught up, I yelled, Go! Go! And we both bolted to the cabin. We got inside and shut the door. My grandma asked why we looked panicked and had slammed the door shut. I knew they wouldn't believe me, so I said that we had seen a bear. My cousin nodded. Later that night, after my grandparents went to sleep, we talked about it. I asked my cousin if he had seen it. He told me that he had paused for a second to look back after he ran to see if I was running with him. He said that he had seen me still looking at it. He said that's when he saw it move and I run. He said he had mostly just seen a flash of fur. He went on to say he thought it wasn't the right color to be a bear. I also agreed that it wasn't the right color to be one and told him that we only had black bears in the area and that it wasn't built like a bear either. I told him I never thought it was a bear. He asked me why I had lied about it to my grandparents. 
I told him they wouldn't have believed us. We've kept it between the two of us until now. Still, the animal didn't match any known regional animal profiles in the area. I'm at a loss for what it may have been. I do know it was stalking us, though, and that it was built like an athletic predator, not like a bear. It wasn't as heavy set as a bear would have been. After the incident, neither of us would go into the woods on foot alone, without a gun. We generally only went back in the woods on a TVs from that point forward. I always loved that cabin, up until then. Fortunately, the cabin has been sold now. My name is Amber Lee, and I live here in Asheville, North Carolina, with my dog, Captain. Captain is the love of my life. He's an Alaskan Klee, Kai High Husky with a mostly black coat, but with streaks of white fur around his legs and face, not to mention little rings of dark fur around his pale blue eyes that make him look like the Hamburglar. I rescued him from a shelter when he was just a puppy right after my fiancé moved out to Hong Kong for work. He helped me through the initial loneliness on nights when I just couldn't handle getting into an empty bed for the fiftieth time. And in the years that followed, when my husband decided he would be better off starting a family with a Chinese woman he met through his job, Captain helped me through the heartbreak. Captain helped me through the heartbreak. Captain is a big guy, a subwoofer. While other dogs need walks, Captain needs hikes. Which is why, every weekend for the past few years, I would drive him out to Nantahala National Forest, one of the few places he could really be. Dogs just aren't mean to be cooped up indoors. They need to run. They need to explore. They need a place like Nantahala. And coincidentally, so did I. Nantahala was a place I could really lose myself. A place to escape the pressures of a high-pressure, high-paying job. The woods were a place of sanctuary to me, but that all changed one chilly October day when I came to realize that there is a damned good reason why human beings have walled themselves off in towns and cities. Because the wilderness, it seems, is not our friend. Captain was always his happiest in the woods. For such a majestic animal, he has an uncanny ability to act goofy as hell, and the woods brought that out of him in spades. He'd be so lost in the feeling of pure freedom, his blue eyes all wide with his tongue lolling out of one side of his mouth, riding the wave of zoomies that inevitably had me laughing at how me laughing at how dorky he acted. So you can imagine how quickly I noticed a change in his behavior. How he went from being such a loud, boisterous dog to a quivering, whining wreck that barely ventured a few feet away from me at any one time. In all the time I'd been taking Captain out to Nantahala, I'd never seen him act in such a way. And when I laid a hand on his neck to give him a stroke, I discovered he was actually trembling in fear. My first thought was that a mountain lion could been in the area, but a previous encounter with what I'd figured was a predator's scent trail had caused Captain to bark incessantly and become overly aggressive. Now, this was back in the fall of last year, and that during the previous summer, the Nantahala had seen a sharp increase in black bear activity, with homeowners being encouraged to be much more careful surrounding issues of food disposal. It was entirely possible that Captain had sniffed out a mama bear and cubs, in which case he was right to be cautious. But he wasn't just cautious, he was outright terrified. I had no idea what to make of such a situation, but one thing was clear— captain wanted out. And consequently, so did I. There was only one big problem with such a plan. We'd already spent like two hours hiking into the woods. Getting out would not be quick or easy. With every step, the tension grew, captain looking behind me with wild, terrified eyes, darting ahead before doubling back to whine at me. Each footstep seemed a little quicker than the last. My utter paranoia growing to fever pitch as I continually looked behind me and continually saw nothing. But something was behind us, Captain Hewitt, and I could feel it. At one point, he bounded back to my side and froze, staring off into the dense forest as he sniffed at the air before him. I thought the worst was over, but I was horribly, horribly wrong. 
With a yelp so loud it hurt my ears, he burst off through the trees ahead, howling barks punctuating his canine gallop. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the trees behind me, and with a terror so rampant I can still feel it to this day. I heard something behind me, breathing, and it was huge. I just ran, following the sound of Captain's barks, crashing through the dense trees as dry branches tore at the bare skin of my face. There are many times in my life where I'd been uncomfortable, anxious, or scared. This experience dwarfed them all. No emotion can compare to that of knowing you're being hunted by something, something you cannot reason or bargain with, something that will crunch your bones into meal and not feel a goddamn thing. I ran harder and longer than I ever have in my life, so intensely that when I finally had to stop to draw breath, I found myself dry retching against a tree trunk, out of exhaustion, out of fear, out of pure biological imperative, making me as light and mobile as possible. But there could be no respite, Captain's furious barks made that abundantly clear. We had to keep moving. It was that, or be eaten alive. With tears in my eyes, I carried on running, hurtling through the forest, the thicket so dense I was running half-blind, which was made painfully obviously when I caught my foot on a fallen tree trunk and was sent flying into the dirt. The impact knocked the wind out of me with an ugly grunt, and as I rolled onto my back, struggling for breath, I saw Captain appear at my side. He had been my hero so many times before and wasn't about to fail me now. His barks were wild, full of rage, his sharp teeth exposed as he poured the raw force of his being into the woods behind us. It was terrifying, awe-inspiring to behold, and in that moment I thanked God that he was on my side. But not even Captain could maintain the display, for when the unseen thing hunting us seemed to roar back through the trees, Captain was silenced. He rushed over to me, taking the collar of my waterproof coat between his teeth and trying to drag me along the forest floor. But I was renewed by terror, by biological imperative, by the goddamn raw need to survive. In an instant, I was back on my feet, running, panting, scrambling for life. I remember there being a moment when I was terrified the captain might leave me, how the fear might prove too much for him to handle. There was so much of the forest for him to escape into, but he never once failed to double back and find me. Even when he was out of sight, he made sure to continue barking furiously so I'd know exactly where to run to. That was until I burst through a set of particularly thick bushes to find Captain stood stationary at a river bank. It wasn't all that wide or all that deep, but it was enough of an obstacle to halt his progress. You see, Captain hated water. I don't know if it was something that happened to him as a puppy before we adopted him from the shelter, but Captain has always hated it. Pools, rivers, lakes. You couldn't get him to go within six feet of any of them, which is why seeing that river in our way terrified me on a whole new level. Out of pure instinct, I just jumped across. Like I said, it wasn't particularly wide but the exhaustion of running for so long meant I only barely made the jump. I turned, knowing that Captain wouldn't even attempt the jump without encouragement or direction. My voice was trembling as I spoke. Someone, boy, jump, jump to Mama! Please, boy, please jump to Mama! It was horrendous, watching his eyes so full of confusion, saying without words, Why are you making me do this? I watched him pacing up and down the bank as the thing hunting us grew closer and closer. In the end, I was begging him, pleading with him, promising steak dinners for an entire year. If it, he would only get his ass across that river. For a moment, he froze, sizing up the gap before sprinting off back among the trees. Again, that terrified feeling gripped me. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He was so terrified of the water that in a moment of pure panic, he'd fled back in the direction of the thing. Chasing us, it felt like an eternity. Standing there on the river bank, praying that he'd reappear, somehow convincing myself that he wouldn't. Only he did. In one glorious moment, he burst from the foliage, hurtling towards the river's edge at breakneck speed. As he reached the bank, his legs at breakneck speed. As he reached the bank, his leg unfurled like springs, sending him sailing through the air, high above the river. 
It's funny the little details you remember from a traumatic event, and one of the things that sticks with me are Captain's eyes as he jumped that river. They were huge, these massive pale blue circles that seemed to shine out from the rings of black fur around them, almost like he couldn't quite believe what he was going, and quite frankly, neither could I. I mean it when I say he was like an action hero in some hyperbolic 80s movie. The bravery he displayed is something I feel I can only aspire to. Even I can only aspire to. Even. His landing was dramatic as hell. He barely made it across and was scrambling up the dirt embankment when I leapt towards him, grabbed him by the collar and pulled him up a collar and pulled him up off the solid ground. When we were up, he took off again with renewed speed, seemingly more terrified of the water than what had been stalking us. I'd had tears in my eyes before, but at that point I broke down completely, calling after him with staggered breathing. Good boy, Captain. Good be boy, Captain. Good be boy. I continued to run, feeling my thighs burn and my feet ache from what felt like miles upon miles of it. I was so short of breath, so goddamn exhausted, I thought I might just pass out at any moment. When I say I could literally hear my own heart beating in my throat, I am not exaggerating in the slightest. I am not an unfit person either. I dance a lot. I take spin class. I have stamina, but running at almost constant sprint for the better part of an hour made it feel like my heart was about to explode out of my chest. By the time I'd reached the peak of yet another gentle incline, my legs gave out from under me. I remember seeing silvery white patches appearing in my vision, and no matter how hard I drew breath, I just couldn't seem to get enough oxygen. When I saw something moving in front of me, something that definitely wasn't Captain, I thought that was it. I thought I'd pass out and never wake up again, having been torn apart by whatever wild animal was chasing us. I woke up in the back seat of a four-seater pickup truck. As soon as I found the strength to sit up, I heard a voice outside the stationary vehicle shout, She's awake. Suddenly the door opened, and a person I'd never seen before in my life was offering me a plastic bottle of water and asking if I was okay. I didn't speak. I just took the water off of him and gulped like three-quarters of it down in one long, sweet chug. By the time I regained my senses, I was panicking. I couldn't see Captain anywhere. I looked at the stranger, dressed in his hunting gear, and tried to summon the strength as ask him where my dog was. Although the words just wouldn't come out, the look on my face must have told him all he needed to know. When he told me Captain was fine, and he was just inside their hunting lodge getting a bite to eat, I just cried with relief. I was overjoyed he was okay, but that's not what made me burst into tears. The hunter told me that, for a while, Captain wouldn't follow any of them out of the truck, no matter how much meat they offered him. He just stayed at my side, yapping and whining, waiting for me to wake up. For a couple of hours, I joined the hunters in their lodge, eating the hamburger they offered me slowly while I regained my strength. I told them exactly what had happened, how Captain had freaked out after we stumbled across what I had assumed was a black bear. But black bears are relatively small, certainly not as big as grizzlies, and certainly not as big as grizzlies, and certainly not as big as whatever had been chasing us through the woods. I raised the issue with them and asked them what they thought it might be. I thought they might have answered, being seasoned hunters, but they didn't. There was this awkward silence as they exchanged looks, before one of them spoke up, telling they just didn't know. I asked if it was possible that a grizzly bear could make it this far down from the Rockies, with one responding that was possible. But that was a lie, an outright lie. Those hunters quite possibly saved my life, and for that I will be eternally grateful. But I know they lied to me. Grizzlies don't make it anywhere near North Carolina at any time of the year. I've done a fair amount of research into what was chasing that day, but I've been unable to come up with anything conclusive. The only thing I know for sure is that those hunters were hiding something, and as long as they do, people will continue to go missing in that stretch of North Carolina woodland. Captain is lying next to my computer chair as I write this. Every faithful, ever watchful, and in my darkest moments, I wonder how ever I'm going to last without him.
Every summer for the past few years, a group of friends and I have traveled from our homes in Liverpool in the UK to Dumfries and Galloway in Scotland. Dumfries and Galloway is home to the largest continuous forest in the whole of the United Kingdom, Galloway Forest Park. It's about as wild as it gets for the UK, with some parts of the woods being so dense and overgrown, that it's clear no one has stepped foot in them for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Our yearly visits brought us peace, clarity, and a respect for nature. But last year's trip ended in one of the most horrifying and distressing incidents of my entire life, one that completely changed the way I see the world and the way I consider the human mind. Year in, year out, we'd take an overnight coach up across the border, then hike out to a place called Loch Aber. The loch is a private fishing lake, supposedly reserved for members of a local fishing club, who ensure that the waters are chock full of fish for them to catch, which makes it oh so easy for us to pull a quick in and out raid to catch enough of the smaller rough fish for our dinner. I'm serious, 45 minutes and we're golden and take it from any fisherman that is lightning speed for a half-decent catch. But last year we decided we were tired of the same old digs and set our gazes further afield. A map told us that there was a similarly deep lock about 30 miles east, known as Lock D. We figured it would be a perfect fishing spot, and we were right. Sure, it wasn't as quick fire as the private member's lake, but it came with considerably less guilt. Everything was going perfect. That was until the second night, when in the middle of a campfire drinking session, one of my buddies jumped out of his seat and recoiled from the fire. Who the hell is that? He asked, sort of calmly at first, nothing more than cautious confusion. Who's who? Someone replies lazily. Someone moving through the trees back there, he was pointing into the trees directly behind my back. I actually gave a hoot of sarcastic laughter at first, thinking he was just trying to scare us. But the moment it became obvious that he was not messing around, a jolt of fear went through me, and I, too, leapt out of my seat, spun around, and shined by torch into the darkness. You could feel the tension among us rising as we desperately looked around for who he might been talking about. Torch beams darted across the trees, inspecting every trunk or thicket of bushes, but there was nothing, no sign of the person my friend had seen. Hello, someone called out, immediately shushed by the rest of us. No one wanted to give away our position, but at the same time we needed to know if there was anyone out there watching us. But again, nothing. Just silence. I think you've had a bit too much to drink, mate. I remember saying to the guy who supposedly seen a figure walking through the trees, I'm fine. I've barely touched that bells I brought. I swear to God I saw someone just then like who? Someone asked. Man, woman, young, old, what? I... I don't know, he replied shakily, but they were big, really big. Only big thing around here is your bloody imagination, mate. Now go and get your head down. It's been a long day, and it had, thanks to the overnight coach. No one really sleeps on the journey up to Scotland. I mean, they close their eyes, put some chill music through their earphones, but they never really sleep, so everyone ends up being pretty wrecked by the end of the first night. The next morning, we felt even worse. The first night after such a long journey is usually one where we sleep like the dead, but not that night. None of us could quite relax, not with the possibility of having someone stalking us in the backs of our minds. Thank God we were only planning to fish that day as we really were not in the mood for anything else, given how bloody exhausted we were. After breakfast, we marched down to the lock with our fishing gear, it's a gorgeous area, a crisp blue lake ringed by hills. It's not unusual to get some really nice sunny days up in Scotland, too, especially during the summer. But that day, the sky was this horrible, grimy gray, like the sun had barely risen at all. I was tired, half-soaked from the drizzle, barely even excited to be fishing for my dinner. I actually hoped for something exciting to happen, and for my sins, my wish came true. Look, one of us shouted, over there, other side it over there, other side of the lock. Jesus Christ, can you see that thing? 
It was the same lad that had seen someone or something walking through the trees. Where? We were terrified. One sighting could have been his eyes playing tricks on him. Another couldn't possibly be a mistake. There, he said, pointing, just on the other side. It came out of the trees for a moment, then disappeared again. Please tell me you saw that. Mate, just calm down. It's probably just... I know what I saw, and we need to get the hell out of these bloody woods right now, he said, grabbing up his fishing gear in a panic. I remember him rushing off back to camp, one of the lads following him, still trying to calm him down. But it was impossible. He was manic, scared half to death by whatever had briefly emerged from the woods on the other side of the lock. I asked the other boys if they'd seen anything. Each shook their head. None have had any idea what he was talking about, but that didn't mean they weren't just as freaked out over his outburst. We were supposed to stay for seven full nights. But that second one was our last. We'd managed to talk the lad who was panicking down, convince him to stay a few nights more at the very least. We'd come all this way, and I wasn't about to let one of us just leave because they'd had a wee scare or something. But it didn't end there either. In the middle of the night, the lad that'd been seeing something burst out of his tent, waking each of us up before asking, can you hear that? There was silence, dead silence, dead silence. I mean, I strained my ears trying to hear what had him so spooked, but I heard nothing, just the rustling of a few sleeping bags as confused blokes sat up awake. He was scratching as his own ears, gritting his teeth, rocking back and forth in the dirt as the sound seemed to completely overwhelm him. That's the exact moment I realized. I think the same moment I realized, I think the same moment everyone else picked up on it, too. That there was no noise. There was no monster. It was all in his head. He was experiencing a psychotic break. And it was all in his head. It was a hot summer day, and I had gone to visit the cave of three lovers in the morning. I was walking on the trail from the cave to the back of the park, when I heard a park ranger reporting to somebody that a large bear was on the loose, and that apparently it was dangerous at that point to be on the trails. I got really worried because, well, I was alone, but I had to go by the ranger station to get to the trailhead to get back to my car. I had to finish my hike. I was pretty nervous and decided to go back to the cave where there were other people. I told another hiker that I was worried about the bear, and he assured me it would be fine. I decided to take his word for it and keep going. I wasn't equipped with anything like I should have been. Bear mace would have been the most optimal. I was so worried that I didn't take a picture of the back of the park, which is pretty amazing, very photogenic. I was going to the trail and I saw it, a bear. It was huge, and it was standing in the middle of the trail. It was black, and it turned to me and began snarling. It was scary, and I wanted to run. But as I got a closer look, and the more I realized it wasn't actually a bear at all, but a short, stocky wolf, all black, long-pointed, tipped ears, and a very long snout. I wasn't even sure what to make of it or how to process it, this thing then starts letting out this awful scream that sounded like a woman being murdered with a mix of a wolf howling. I was so scared I didn't know what to do. I started walking backwards and this thing starts walking towards me. So I turned around and started running and it began chasing me. I felt I had this thing caught up to me. It would have killed me. I jumped in the brush next to me to try and avoid it. I kept running even though I could hear it running after me. I got to the parking lot and ran to my car. I had to climb the fence. I had to turn around and see if it was following me. It was. I climbed the fence and I was over it. And I was now running to the car. I was so scared I was crying. I didn't know what to do, so I get in my car and I lock the doors. Now I'm shaking and scared I turn my car on. And it was making this grinding noise. I screamed. I thought this thing was going to get in the car and get me. I started going down the road, and this thing was running along the fence. I kept going and along the fence. I kept going, and I looked in my rearview mirror to see if it was still there. Oh, I saw the thing. It was still running, but it was slowly coming to a stop.
It was still looking at me. I was scared. I almost didn't want to look. Then it kind of fell on the ground, throwing its head back and forth, convulsing strangely and then jumping back up to run off the way into the woods. I cried harder because I was so scared and grateful that I wasn't dead. Being a 23-year-old girl, I feel like I wouldn't have been strong enough to keep that thing back from me. I'm glad I survived. I usually am an adventure seeker, but after this I will be going less off the beaten path. I've never been more scared than I ever was on this hike, ever. What you're about to read is a warning. I beg you, I implore you, please do not go hiking in the woods around Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I know those woods like the back of my hand. I was playing with my little brother among those trees when I was still in single-digit ages. So trust me when I say that something has been changing out there and not for the better. I first noticed something was horribly wrong during a hike a few weeks back. In early spring, birds migrate back from the warmer, southern climates to their northern territories in Massey. Thousands upon thousands of tiny songbirds occupy the trees around Mount Greylock during the month of March, each singing a sweet, chirpy song that is, in reality, a bellowed war cry, a call for challengers to step up and knock them off their perch. Yet as I trudged through the previous winter's leaf litter, I couldn't hear a single goddamn thing. No birds or any other animals, for that matter, seemed to still call the forest home. This made me nervous for two reasons. One, animals have an uncanny ability to detect dangers that are imperceptible to humans. Their sense of smell, hearing, and general atmospherics are far superior to our own. If the wildlife had fled the area in such a hurry, or at least refused to return, that could mean something awful was about to happen. And two, areas of woodland turn exceptionally quiet when there is a large predator around. Wood pigeons will become deathly quiet and still, hoping a black bear or mountain lion will just pass them by. Sometimes they don't, but either way, it would be hideously unsafe of me. That either way, it would be hideously unsafe of me to wander around while one was prowling the area. So naturally, I started making my way back towards my car when something real peculiar happened. I feel I should remind you at this point that I'd been playing in the woods around Mount Greylock since I was like seven or eight years old. It's pretty far from where our family lived when I was a kid, but thanks to our bikes, we had a pretty large area to roam when it came to those long summer breaks. Point being, I know those woods really well, but some way, somehow, I managed to get lost. It first came to my attention that I'd managed to get myself turned around when I felt my head begin to throb with a dull ache. I stopped walking for a moment, rubbing my eyes and the bridge of my nose to try and massage away the ache. But when I opened my eyes again and looked around, I felt a faint flash of panic running through me. I did not recognize my surroundings, and I cannot understate how jarring that was for me to be somewhere I'd been visiting all my life only for it to feel utterly foreign to me. I actually had to take a moment to take out my compass just to try and get a bearing of where I was headed. But to my surprise, the compass needle kept slowly moving around. Even when I got it to sit still on a supposed bearing, it slowly began creeping around again. Now this was much less of a problem than it might appear. Sure, it was unnerving, but there are ways around a faulty compass. Like for one, moss mostly grows on the north side of a tree, the side that gets the most sunlight. So that provided an easy way of determining which way was north. At least it usually would. Because, as I inspected various tree trunks, I realized the sun was hanging in the southern portion of the sky. That or the moss in this area grew mostly on the south section of the tree trunks. I get that it's not entirely out of the question, but that was yet another detail that just seemed to fry my brain. Nothing made sense. And the less it did, the more the feeling of pure panic began to bubble up in my chest. But to panic in that situation, in any kind of situation, it gradation is to welcome defeat, degradation, and death. 
I kept myself calm, told me there was a rational explanation for everything that was occurring, and walked off in the direction I was almost sure the nearest highway was. It was then I came across something I'd never, ever seen in those woods before, something that seemed so out of place that it was frankly terrifying. In all the years I'd spent roaming those woods with my brother as a kid, I'd never seen anything like the old, run-down cabin that stood before me. And I mean it was old, as in there was no way it could have been built any later than like 1979. So just how me and my brother had missed this place was utterly beyond me. The obvious thing to do was to knock on the cabin door, see if anyone was home, and as much as I might find it humiliating, ask for directions. But as I walked closer and closer towards the rustic front door, I felt the most unusual sensation. I put it down to general tiredness. Maybe my blood sugar was low. I'm not entirely sure. But for whatever reason, each footstep that took me closer to the cabin seemed more and more difficult. By the time I was actually bringing a closed fist up to knock on that old wooden door, it felt like something was physically repelling me from it whispering directly into my brain, leave this place and never return. Don't look back, never look back. When I finally knocked, the door creaked open slightly, revealing the dilapidation behind it. Whatever bolts or locks that were on the door had long since been worn away, and the inside was just as run down and rotten as the outside was. It was evidently abandoned, but there was a curious order to the furniture that led me to believe that every so often, the cabin did actually receive some visitors, aside from me, but something in the corner of the cabin drew my attention. I saw it drew my attention. What I'm about to attempt to describe is, quite frankly, indescribable. I know it was a wooden idol of some kind, a small statuette set atop of a stone altar, but, and I appreciate this is intensely confusing to read, I could not make sense of what I was looking at. It was like my brain was completely incapable of computing the information my eyes were feeding it, and with that, my headache returned again, along with a kind of anxiety so crushing that I felt like I was going to have a panic attack. Don't ask me how I know, but that wooden idol, a mess of twigs and vines and moss, was a representation of pure, unfiltered evil and I ran from it, I'm not in the least bit ashamed to admit that I ran like a scared child from that cabin. And into the night, the night. You read that right. When I walked into that cabin, it was still daylight. I couldn't have been there for more than a couple of minutes. At least, that's what it felt like. Only when I burst through that wooden door, it was pitched black outside. I ran until I found the highway, ran until I found my car, and drove like a madman until I was safely back at home. I haven't been able to bring myself to talk about what happened to me that day until now. I tried to tell a hunting buddy of mine once, but the words just wouldn't seem to come out. But please, if you're reading this, heed my warning, and do not go hiking in the woods around Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I live in a small town in a rural area where there's not much to do but drive around. Last fall, around 1-2 a.m., two friends and I were driving around aimlessly our country roads, equipped with slushies in hand from the only gas station that was still open, just as we've done thousands of times before. This time we'd turned onto a particularly desolate country road, one that we typically seem to subconsciously avoid for whatever reason. We didn't notice we were on it at first. We were too busy talking about college and boys and whatever else was on our minds when my friend slammed on her brakes. A deer, a buck to be exact, trotted across the road. Innocent enough, right. That's what we all thought or rather convinced ourselves as we sat in silence as we continued to drive. As soon as we got to a more familiar road, I let out a stifled laugh. I looked at my two friends and said I think I'm going crazy because I literally thought that was a man running on all fours at first. I watched their faces fall. It turns out all three of us could sworn that we'd seen a man running on all fours across the street. But that doesn't make sense. It was clearly a deer. We all saw it on the other side of the road. 
We know it was a deer, so why did we all think the same very specific thing? I didn't think much of it until last night, when I woke up in the middle of the night to see a deer standing in front of my suburban house, looking into my window, pretty far from any forests or fields. Obviously, deer are common, and it's not rare for deer to wander out this way, but it reminded me of the incident from last fall. Has anyone else had a similar experience? Again, I could totally just be overreacting. I'm a 32-year-old lady from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks. All that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Thomason Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park. I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land. She had received permission from... I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes, I was a Dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an Apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing. But I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I'd never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say, it sounded like it. No one was home. No media was on. And yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where and the sound of furniture being dragged right from under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike. But even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go out to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horses' breeds for their names rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horses' names. I was 18 to 19 in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows. I hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and in my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I, I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence again. It happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. 
I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky treat. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. So the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of the large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture to keep her from escaping, too. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho Appaloosa mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No. As I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny little fence, in area, under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny, fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over sixteen hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough. He touched both sides, going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral the last time she got out. Much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm thirty-two now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had Appaloosas, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, Mustangs, foals, geldings that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially not in a group. I had two severely abused horses. I was rehabbing, a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD, and a racking horse that actually took me three years to touch. Without some sort of a bad reaction, they did not like being in stalls, and all but one were mares. Maris are extremely moody, and two of mine were particularly vicious to those they didn't like. My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Mine also didn't like to be under lights when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague, and not eating grass. That was over ankle deep. That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead him out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt, crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their behavior, so I laid them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn like glue and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking it's the uh, appy flipping out that's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. 
I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me, like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast in a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panic gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of through the pasture. Again, the pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to see by. The spot on the road where I was at was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid, as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I would like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight, right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eyes shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chouse? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me, something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture, and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight. On the one it was next to, this thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there, watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any, though, so I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there, watching, frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways, a few times. I'll lie one eye. I think it went into the cups of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there a long time after, looking for eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point. I considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack at his house. Halters and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know, I should have left the tack. I also know you're not supposed to run. But I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch-black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning, and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. 
I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her, or was it in the unlit barn? I walked through to get to the road. Was it the reason the appy swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line away from the woods. I did look for tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost that morning. But I will say the appy mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. It was high noon when I went down there to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area, or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that my mother filed for divorce. My ex-stepfather got the farm, and I moved in with her in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were non-bipedal things going on, too. I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the eye shine event. I didn't see the actual creature, and really, how do you convey that unnatural horror-inducing feeling? You saw eye shine, hoop dee doo My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo. My wife and I were avid hikers. This was in 2008, a time where we had just gotten married, and I was in the full height of my park ranger career. We loved the Rocky Mountains. We had also gotten a job in Colorado, so we ended up moving out here to Colorado. We decided to go on a hike on one of our first days here. We went to this place called the Devil's Head Rock Climbing Area, very close to Breckenridge, Colorado. We had gone there and hiked on our way back. It was just before dusk. We were walking back to the car, and I was looking across the valley that we were currently in. I saw something. It was about a mile away. I thought I was seeing things, so I called my wife over, and I was pointing to this thing that I was seeing. She saw it, too. We both saw it. It was dark, maybe six feet three tall and skinny. It had scales on its face and a very elongated face, a very long, thin neck. It was walking on its legs like a human, but walking across the valley kind of in a jogging motion. Just for a few moments, it disappeared into the woods and was gone. It was almost like it did not want us to follow it. At the time, we thought it was maybe a deer, but we realized deer don't look like this or move like this or it had the features of a wendigo. What else could it be? Thanks for your time and take care. I was a young police officer, fresh out of the academy and eager to make a difference on the streets. I had always dreamed of being a cop and I was determined to do whatever it took to catch the bad guys and keep the city safe. One night I was called to the scene of a brutal crime. The victims were brutally attacked, and there were bite marks all over their bodies. At first I thought it might have been an animal attack, but the teeth marks were unlike anything I had ever seen before. They were jagged and uneven, like nothing any animal I knew of could have made. I told my sergeant that I thought some kind of creature had attacked the victims, but he just laughed and told me I was insane. He said I should forget about it and focus on finding the real perpetrator, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to this crime than met the eye. Feeling unsure of what to think, I decided to return to the crime scene on my own. As I walked through the dark, abandoned house, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I kept my gun at the ready unsure of what I might find. As I entered the room where the victims were found, I saw something that chilled me to the bone. There, crouched over one of the corpses, was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. 
It was a crawler with long, spindly legs and a twisted, distorted body. It was sucking the blood from the corpse, and I could see its razor-sharp teeth glinting in the dim light. Without hesitation, I aimed my gun and fired. But the creature was too fast, and it dodged out of the way. It ran through the window and was gone before I could get off another shot. I ran to the window, but there was no sign of the creature. It had vanished into the night. I sat there, staring out into the darkness, trying to make sense of what I had just seen. I knew that no one would believe me if I told them about the crawler. They would think I was crazy or worse, that I was covering up my own mistakes. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something out there stalking the streets, preying on the innocent. I knew that I had to do something to stop it, but I didn't know where to start. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had missed my chance to stop the creature and that it would continue to roam the city, hunting for its next victim. I sat there for hours, lost in thought, trying to come up with a plan, but it was no use. I couldn't think of anything that could stop the creature. And so I sat there in the darkness, alone, unsure of what the future held. As the night went on, I realized that I couldn't just sit there and do nothing. I had to tell someone about what I had seen, even if no one would believe me. So I gathered my courage and went to my sergeant, and I told him everything. I was prepared to be laughed at, but he just looked at me with a serious face and told me that he would investigate the matter. I was relieved, and at the same time, scared of what the truth might be, scared that the creature might be real and that it would come back for me. From that night on, I was a changed man, haunted by the memory of the crawler and the knowledge that somewhere out there, it was still lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. I was a secret FBI agent, on the run from the government. I kid you not, I had uncovered a shocking truth. The U.S. government was hiding over 10,000 cryptids in Area 51. I had the documents to prove it, and I was determined to share this information with the world. But as soon as I started to go public with my findings, two men in black were sent to silence me. They chased me through the streets, but I managed to escape into the deep woods. I knew I had to keep moving, but my laptop battery was running low. I needed to find a way to charge it so I could share my evidence. I followed an unusual trail through the woods, hoping it would lead me to safety. Just as I was about to give up hope, I saw an incoming car. I ran towards it, hoping it was someone who could help me. But as I got closer, I saw that the driver and passenger were the same two men in black who had been chasing me. They had found me. I tried to run, but they were too fast. They caught up to me and dragged me into the car. I struggled and fought, but it was no use. They were too strong. As the car drove deeper into the woods, I knew that my fate was sealed. I was going to be killed for knowing too much. But as we drove, something strange began to happen. The men in black started to change. Their faces twisted and contorted, and their bodies twisted and elongated. They were no longer human. I realized then that I had stumbled upon a government secret far more horrifying than anything I could have imagined. These cryptids, these creatures, they weren't just being hidden away in Area 51. They were being used as government agents sent to hunt down and eliminate anyone who dared to uncover the truth. I was trapped in that car with two monsters, and there was nothing I could do to stop them. As the car pulled to a stop in the middle of the woods, I knew that this was the end for me. But just as the monsters were about to kill me, something miraculous happened. My laptop, which I had thought was dead, suddenly turned on. The battery had somehow been recharged, and the documents I had been trying to share with the world were now accessible. These agents just took my laptop, threw me away from a car, and continued to drive. I was puzzled. I decided to send you this story, so you can do whatever you want with it. My father and I had just left the La Burbage grocery store and were crossing 30 seconds to go toward my car when we heard what sounded like a baby crying out. We thought it was maybe one of the neighbor's babies, but then my father said Miramija and was pointing toward the house across the street. 
I looked and saw a thin black figure perched on the brick fence post and looking directly at us. This thing was dark, dark black. It actually looked like it was absorbing the light around it. It was very easy to make out the body, the wings, and the long pointed tail that it swished around much like a cat does when it is interested in something. The eyes were the most striking feature as they were glowing bright red and were locked directly on my father and me. I was frozen in fear, and the only thing going through my mind was how to defend my elderly father if this thing decided to attack us. I could care less about myself, but my father is seventy years old and not able to move or defend himself if he was attacked. I could hear my father praying and asking La Virgin de Guadalupe for protection and to send this thing away. I managed to tell my father that we needed to get into the car as quickly as possible so we could be safe. I pressed the button to the remote, and the horn chirped as the alarm was deactivated and the doors unlocked. At the sound of the horn, chirping this thing opened its wings and stood up on the fence post and chirped back at us. It took off and hovered for a few seconds, its wings flapping and making a light whoosh sound. My father and I dove into the relative safety of the car as this thing flew away and was gone from our sight. This thing was maybe three, four feet tall and thin but its wings were large and maybe ten feet when spread apart. They looked a lot like bat wings. No feathers were visible as it was jet black. We drove straight home, and my father told my mother and my sister about our encounter with this thing and what had happened. My mother said it was probably a brugia disguised as a lechuza and that we were lucky we were not attacked. Either way, she refused to let anyone out of the house for the rest of the night. Every now and then things happen at work, they really scare me. As a sheriff, you'd likely assume that those things are shootings or break-ins or bombings. Things of that nature. Although all those things are terrifying, it's the things that I can't quite explain clearly that scare me. There's nothing worse than dealing with something for which there is no protocol. Those are the moments when I feel as if my life is truly on the line. One such afternoon, someone came to me and asked if I could speak to an elderly woman who was insisting that the sheriff speak to her. It seemed urgent, so I agreed and picked up the call. She sounded completely terrified. She explained to me that she had trapped an animal in one of the rooms of her house. Now in the background, I could hear loud noises like banging and screeching. In between the noises, I could hear a cackling sound. I asked who was with her in the house, and she said that she was alone. Still, I could hear the cackling, so I asked her again who was with her. I'm alone, she replied. It's the animal that's laughing. I didn't quite know what to make of it, and a routine animal control call quickly turned into a wellness check. She seemed rather stressed, but I knew that there had to have been someone with her making that sound. Still, I called in animal control to meet me at the house just in case she had a raccoon or something with her. When we got there, I rang the doorbell. A frail old woman answered, and she was shaking. She was so terrified. All along her arms and legs, I could see some serious bruising. I asked her who did it to her, and she said that it was the animal that was now trapped in her spare bedroom. I looked toward the animal control officer, and he stared back at me with a look of disbelief. We entered the home, and she showed us toward the spare room. Behind the door, we could hear loud banging sounds and things breaking. From inside, I could still hear the cackling. I asked the woman if there was anyone inside with the animal. I told you, she whispered. It's the animal making that sound. I looked toward the animal control officer for answers, but he just widened his eyes and shook his head. He motioned with his head that I needed to take the lady outside, and I happily agreed. I was in no way prepared to stick around and find out what was happening behind that closed door. I was out on the front lawn with her when I heard the animal control officer let out a scream. It was followed by banging and breaking sounds throughout the entire house. The next minute, a large dog, like animal, came crashing through one of the side windows of the property. It fell, rolling onto its side. I noticed that it had large paws with incredibly long nails attached. Its limbs were longer and thinner than any normal dog. It seemed larger than a wolf. 
The elderly lady ducked behind me, but the creature simply cackled again and bolted off into the distance. It moved faster than any dog I've ever seen. There was no way any of us would have been able to catch up with it. Still, I had other priorities. I told the lady to go across the road to her neighbor's house as I ran in to check on the animal control officer. I found him on the ground, just waking up after being knocked out. The door to the room was broken, with the lock bent completely out of shape. It was clear that the animal had broken the door down from the inside. The house was completely trashed where the animal had run through it. I asked the animal control officer what the creature was, and he just rubbed his head and looked at me with tear-filled eyes. I've heard stories of that damn thing, but I thought they were just campfire horror stories. He said, I helped him up off the ground and called in for paramedics to come check on the officer and the elderly lady. Both wound up being treated for shock, and the animal control officer had a mild concussion. I spent some time after my shift helping the lady clean up her house. I've been in to check on her a couple of times since then, but she's moving to Florida with her children. The last I spoke to her, she said she has nightmares and is afraid to leave the windows open. I feel terrible that we couldn't help her. I've put pressure on animal control to learn what they can and do their best to combat this thing, whatever it is. But it hasn't been seen again since. Each county has their own madman to deal with. Sometimes they cause harm, sometimes they're harmless. I'm fortunate that the madman in my county is fairly harmless. He was part of the French Foreign Legion for some time, and after he retired, he sort of lost his marbles a little bit. Most of the time, when he showed up at the police station, he would ramble on about being followed by someone, or claim that his house was being bugged. Considering his mental health, I would sometimes send an officer to check on his house or follow him home, just so that he feels safe. The last thing I want is for someone mad or not to be afraid and feel as if the police cannot help him or her. Anyway, one day he came running into the station, but this time he didn't seem at all panicked. He seemed excited. He bypassed all protocols and walked straight into my office. Because we know him well and know that he's mostly harmless, I welcomed him to take a seat. Instead, he opened a map up on my desk on which he had drawn red trails all over the place. Each marker had a day of the week and a set of times. I figured out the pattern, he said calmly. Something about how calm he was really unsettled me, so I asked him to explain what he was talking about. The skinwalker that's been coming to my house, remember? I've been timing it, and I know it's routine. I can help you catch it. Now I remember him rambling something about some kind of animal like that before, but I didn't really take it seriously. I figured it was just another one of his bouts of paranoia. I looked at the map and back at him. He wasn't fidgeting or causing a fuss in any way. He was completely collected and the most sane I'd ever seen him. Something about it gave me the sense that it was too much for a junior officer to manage. I knew instantly that it would take more than just a search of his house or a police car following him home to fix this. I looked at the map and it was rather detailed. It will be passing by my house again tonight, he said, tapping his finger on the map where his house was marked. I noticed that it was marked with a time 8.12 p.m. All right, I said. Let's catch it then. I called Animal Control and asked them to send someone to meet me at his address at 7.30 that night. The madman thanked me and said that he'd have coffee and tea waiting for us when we got there. I thanked him and carried on with my day. The animal control officer met me precisely on time, and the madman gave us a rundown on his map and the trail he had put together for the animal. The animal control officer asked him to describe the animal so we knew what to look out for. He simply responded with, You'll see it, trust me. We took the map and gladly accepted the coffee from him. Then the three of us sat quietly and waited. Eventually, the madman whispered, Two more minutes. I couldn't believe my eyes when exactly at 8.12 p.m. the bushes in front of us rustled. What appeared was something I'll never forget. It looked like a coyote, but much larger. It also walked funny, as if its legs were too long or large for its body. What is that? 
I whispered the animal control officer. He was already loading his dart gun when he answered. I have no idea. He wasted no time, aiming and firing. The creature let out a yelp, stood briefly on its hind legs, and then ran off back in the direction it came. I jumped up to run after it, but the madman tugged on my sleeve. It's no use, he said. It's too fast. I've tried. I looked at him in disbelief. He hadn't been lying at all. I turned to the animal control officer. What about the dart? That will knock it out. The officer laughed. That was no tranquilizer. That animal was too big for the dosage I have on me. That was a tracking dart. With nothing more to do, I took some photos of the madman's map, thanked him for the coffee, and went to file the paperwork. The case was then officially handed over to animal control. When I checked with the animal control officer again, he said they were able to track the animal for a week and that it had followed the madman's map exactly. Then one day they found the dart on the ground, and nobody has seen the creature again. Back in 1999, I used to work as a park ranger over at Yosemite National Park. It wasn't a job I ever really saw myself doing. The fact was that until I busted my knees and had to stop playing football, the NFL was all I ever dreamed of. I was obsessed. It was football in the morning, football in the afternoon, and at night I used to dream of football. But like many young men's dreams, they turned out to be nothing but the stuff of pipes. I needed a job, I needed money, and I needed it fast. So when an uncle told me of an opening up at Yosemite for a park ranger, I jumped at the chance. He told me it was relatively easy work, mostly outdoors, and I could rely on it. As long as there was state funding, as long as there were still trees sprouting out of the ground, I'd always have work. So there I was, 23 years old, decked out in my park ranger's uniform, hiking through valleys and over hills, popping ibuprofen whenever my knees started to play up. I'd done the job for about two years in March of 99, and honestly, I'd grown to love it. Being out there meant being surrounded by nature on a daily basis. I mean, I'd see things weekly that wildlife photographers would give their left nuts to document. But I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd encounter the kind of thing I did on March 18th, 1999. It's something that I've thought about almost every single day since something I can't ever get out of my mind and something I don't think I ever will. And it started off a chain of events that I gradually became obsessed with and that have changed my life forever. It started with a call about a potential forest fire up. My boss called and told me a hiker had seen some smoke rising up through the trees up near a place called Long Cabin in Sonora County. I probably don't need to tell you that forest fires can be absolutely devastating to an area like Yosemite and are taken very, very seriously by us park rangers. Now y'all should know that long cabin isn't technically in our jurisdiction. It's actually closer to Stanislaus National Forest. But since there was no one up in that area to go check it out, my boss asked me to go check it out. My boss asked me to go check it out and call in the fire department if it was a serious threat. We get a good number of calls like this, and more often than not, it's just a family whose barbeque has gotten out of hand, or kids whose campfire is a little too big, so I agreed to drive up there to check it out, as it was only a couple of hours' drive there and back. So after about an hour's drive, I arrive up at Long Barn, and I can see some black smoke rising up through the trees in the distance. This is unusual, as black smoke means it's not just wood burning, more like plastic or artificial fabrics, so it definitely wasn't wood burning. This is kind of a relief at first. It meant it wasn't an outright forest fire, but it did mean someone was burning something that was definitely not good for the environment. I park up as close as I can to the source of the smoke, then hike off through the trees basically just following my nose as the smell of the burning plastics got stronger and stronger. Then I see it, a burned-out car abandoned among the trees, still kind of smoldering, but I guess the fire had been set at night and had mostly burned through before I got the call about it. My first thought was joyriders, 
something as simple as car thieves that had bust into someone's vehicle, tore it up and down the quiet country roads up here, then just abandoned it and set it alight to cover up any evidence. Again, this is a pretty unusual crime out here in the sticks, and you can forgive me for associating that sort of wanton mischief with more urban areas. But then I started to smell something else among the smoke, something more like burning meat. I'm a huge barbeque guy myself, and I know what it smells like when you leave something on the grill for too long, like that acrid, charred stench that I know is going to lead to disappointment because I've messed up on some expensive tea, one, or whatever. Only, you're definitely not supposed to smell that coming off of a burning car, are you? And as you can imagine, I started to feel very, very uneasy about the whole thing. I circled the burned our vehicle, looking for signs of animal carcasses or, God forbid, human bodies that were in or around the vehicle, but saw nothing. I even checked under the car, but again, didn't see a thing. I pulled out my phone to get in touch with the Sonora County Sheriff, who said he'd send over a couple of guys to check the scene out within the next hour or so, but who also asked me to stick around so I could guide them in and show them exactly where the vehicle was. So, given the fact I had an hour or two to kill waiting for them, I went into the trunk of my truck, pulled out the little fire extinguisher stored back there, and proceeded to put out the few small fires still burning in and around the vehicle. I do so pretty effectively, but when I'm done and I notice there's still something smoldering in the trunk, smoke keeps seeping out of the cracks, and the more it does, the more I can smell that burning meat smell. That's when it really hit me. Something, or someone, was in that trunk. That's where the smell of was coming from. Waiting for those sheriff's deputies seemed like it took an eternity. Mainly because when they got there, I knew they'd be able to open that trunk, and I really didn't want to see what was inside. So they get there, I tell them what I suspect has happened, and what I suspect has happened, and what I suspect is in that trunk. One of the guys uses a crowbar to wrench the trunk open which was pretty easy considering the fire had warped the metal locks keeping it closed. But what we saw inside is something I saw over and over again in my nightmares for many nights to come. It was a mess of blackened, burned flesh and contorted limbs. The sight of it alone caused me to gag and retch, puking up my breakfast onto the forest floor. Even those deputies, hardened by years of witnessing violence and cruelty on a daily basis, had a hard time dealing with what they were seeing. One just leaned against a tree, mouth covered with a cloth rag he kept on him, probably for this exact reason, while the other called in the coroner to deal with the bodies. They told me I could make a move back to Yosemite whenever I was ready, and boy was I ready. I got the hell out of there as soon as I was able to. From what I understand, the sheriff's deputies soon discovered that the two scorched bodies in the trunk of that burned-out vehicle were those of Carola's son and Silvina Palasso. The two women, along with Carolee's son's young daughter, Julie, had been missing since the previous February, when they were last sighted alive and well at the Cedar Lodge near Yosemite National Park. It was actually one of my colleagues over at the park that had been the last person to see them alive, and the whole thing had drawn national attention, landing them on the cover of People magazine when some journalist took an interest in the story. And I mean, it was a really interesting story, albeit a very morbid one. Girlie's son's wallet had been found on a street in downtown Modesto, California three days after they had disappeared, and Julie's son's body was found dumped in heavy underbrush by an overlook at the Don Pedro Reservoir, several miles from the logging trail where the car had been found. Her throat had been slit from ear to ear. Local sheriffs and the FBI initially focused their investigation on a group of meth heads up in Northern California who had previous convictions for stalking and assaulting lone groups of women. But all those leads were abandoned when a break in the case cast light on another suspect. Because the story doesn't end here. In fact, it got even worse for all of us that worked up in Yosemite. One of the staff members at the Yosemite Institute was a young woman named Joey Ruth Armstrong. 
Joey was friendly, bubbly, and generally just a joy to be around. I'd only ever met her once or twice in my time as a park ranger, but I could see why she was a popular member of the team. She loved nature, and she loved nature, and she loved her job, even more passionately than most others on our staff. But in July of that same year, 1999, Joey had made plans to spend a weekend visiting friends down in Sausalito. Team members who lived in the log cabin she shared with them in Yosemite Village said their goodbyes, wished her safe travels, and watched as she wandered off among the trees to catch a ride down to Sausalito. But a few days later, when she was due to return to the village, she didn't show up. She'd actually left some contact details with the team, just in case they needed to talk to her, but when they followed up with a call to check up on her, her friends told them she hadn't actually arrived to spend the weekend with them, and that they were starting to get worried. A group of rangers went over to the cabin she stayed at, only to find her white pickup truck was still parked in the driveway, packed with luggage for her trip. Having decided to begin their search in the immediate area, the rangers split up into smaller groups. They trudged through dense brush, watching for rattlesnakes and looking for signs of their missing co-worker. Then after only a short while of searching, they apparently spotted footprints, broken saplings, trampled ferns and grass. All signs that someone had recently ran or perhaps even been chases. That's when one of the rangers noticed something metallic glinting in the sunlight just a few feet away. It was a key ring lying in a shallow ditch. It was the sighting of this key ring that led them to spot something else. It was a dead body. It had on the white t-shirt and blue jeans that Joy had been wearing the day she left for Sausalite. Except now they were filthy, dirty, and crusted and bloodstained. But despite bearing such similarities to our missing co-workers, it was impossible to immediately identify the body. That was because whoever had killed this person had also taken the time to cut off the head, decapitating it completely. For those of us that worked in and around Yosemite, Joey's murder meant that the nightmare of the those burned bodies, the nightmare we'd all tried to forget about, had come back with a vengeance. The killings were made even more disturbing to us by just how rare it was for anything like that to happen in this area of California. According to one of the older rangers, the last known murder to occur inside Yosemite's boundaries happened 12 years earlier, in 1987, when a guy pushed his wife off a cliff in order to collect on a life insurance policy. As you can tell, I've thought about this whole thing and researched the various murders a whole lot. And I've discovered that the chances of being murdered in one of our nation's national parks is about one in 20 million. Basically, you have more chance of drowning in your own bathtub, so please don't think this is an actual thing. People don't just hang around in the woods waiting to ambush unwary hikers. In the months that had followed the discovery of those burned bodies in the trunk of the car, the cops had almost no luck in finding a suspect. And honestly, we didn't expect Joey's murder to be any different. But unbelievably, in the immediate aftermath of her killing, local authorities got lucky thanks to a witness statement given by one of our co-workers. They had noticed a blue and white 1979 International Scout parked near Joey's cabin on the night of her death, and the cops put out an ab on it right away. Then a few days later on, two park rangers spotted a vehicle that looked remarkably similar parked on the shoulder of a highway not too far away. What happened next was truly bizarre. I spoke to the guys who found the truck, who said they searched around it for a while until they came across a guy sunbathing, completely naked, at a nearby riverbank. They asked who he was, and he told them he was a handyman at the Cedar Lodge. Some vacation homes built close by, and that his name was Carrie Stainer. The guy seemed kind of embarrassed that he'd been caught in the nude like that and quickly left the area. But my co-workers immediately called the encounter into local cops, who showed up and compared the tire tacks left by the truck to those left at the scene of Joey's murder. They came back as exactly identical. A few days later, the same weird guy was taken into custody while he was visiting some nudist resort over near Sacramento. 
When they took him into custody and interviewed him regarding Joey's murder, he confessed. Just straight up confessed. Then also confessed to the fact that he'd murdered Carollo's son, Silvina Palazzo, as well as Carollo's daughter, Julie. The FBI were called in for additional questioning, and it was then that Carrie Stainer told them all about how he had fantasized about hurting women ever since he was a child and how he had been completely unable to silence the voices in his head that told him to kill them. For five whole months, this absolute psychopath had been living right under our goddamn noses, hiding in plain sight. He'd been chilling up at Cedar Lodge, doing his job and eyeing up potential victims under the pretense of being a friendly, albeit a little cookie, local handyman. From what I can gather, no one had suspected him of having anything to do with the disappearances of Sander Palazzo because he just seemed way too nice. Too much of a regular dude that, in the Steiner family name, had been in the news before for a reason that led investigators to believe that there was no way that Carey had it in him to do something so terrible. You see, many years before, when Carey was just 11 years old, his younger brother, seven-year-old Stephen, disappeared without a trace one afternoon while walking home from school on his own. This devastated the family, causing a huge rift between Carey and his dad. Eventually, Stephen escaped captivity after seven long years as the sex slave of Kenneth Parnell, a convicted pedophile and former employee of the Yosemite Lodge inside the National Park. He became a celebrity of sorts. There was national newspaper and television coverage, as well as a book and a TV miniseries chronicling his years of abuse. Whether or not that whole thing shaped Carey into the violent psychopath he eventually became is something I don't think anyone will be able to properly determine. But shortly after, Carey began to claim he'd seen Bigfoot. Yes, the ape, man-thing that said to inhabit the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was well on his way to be being completely detached from reality. At his trial in 2002, Carey Stainer pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, his lawyers asserted that the entire Stainer family had a history of sexual abuse and mental illness, manifesting itself not only in the murders, but also his obsessive compulsive disorder, his obsession with cryptids, specifically Bigfoot, in his request to be provided with obscene images in return for his eventual confession. He was nevertheless found sane and convicted of four counts of first-degree murder by a jury on August 27, 2002. The court then had to decide if he would be executed for his crimes, which it unanimously decided that he should, and rightly so. Stainer remains on death row as of September 2019, but problems with California death penalty laws are frustrating the process and it's becoming increasingly unlikely that Kerry will suffer the same fate as his many victims. I know this was an overly long post, but as I'm sure you can all understand, this is something I've been quite frankly obsessed about since the discovery of those burned bodies affected me to personally. I'm actually considering writing a book about the whole thing, and my experiences living and working in the places that most of these crimes occurred. If I can't ever get these things out of my head, why not try and turn the whole thing into a kind of therapy? Turn it into something that others can enjoy and maybe something I can make a few bucks out of. Even if that does make me feel like a goddamn vampire profiting off of other people. Misery. Maybe let me know in the comments section, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed reading this, and maybe, just maybe, it'll help you stay safe in a world where people are out there with the word compulsions imaginable driving them to kill. It was an amazing day. Hell, it had been an amazing week. I was finally off from work in my little mini. Vacation was starting. I had been keeping track of the weather and made sure that the days I wanted to go on vacation would be great for some hiking and camping. I live in Altoona, Pa, in the middle of the state. My role in life is to explore every state park in Pennsylvania. 
I decided that when I was a youngin, I would make it my life's goal to visit and write about every park I could travel to. I'm a young man, and as long as I stayed healthy and strong, I should be able to do it. There are 111 state parks in Pennsylvania, 20 state forests, one national forest, one national forest, one national memorial, two national historic sites, and three national historic parks. I've been to half of the state forests and 30 of the state parks. I usually start at the parks on the outside of the state and work clockwise from Altoona as the six o'clock position. But I have a friend who loves Black Machannon State Park and she's always talking about how good the fishing is on the lake. She raves about the hiking and the trails and even though it's close to a highway, it's secluded enough to feel like you're in a world of your own, which is what I needed. I work at a Wawa and I kinda hit the lottery for a decent amount of money. Not enough to retire, but enough to retire, but enough to afford my condo, keep up the hole, and go on vacation when I wanted to, which is what I'm doing now. So here we are. I'm gonna head up to Moshannon and see what the fuss is all about. I woke up about 5.30 and finished loading up the car. I got some breakfast from the job and headed up Highway 99, then cut over to Alternate 220, then on to Beaver Road, as that would take me right into the middle of Black Moshannon, past the lake into the camping grounds. Since the deer season was ending, the park's traffic would primarily be locals and the rare tourists. I got there by quarter to ten. The sun was high and the air was cooler than average for August. It felt great, good enough for a hike. After setting up camp and securing the site with a few locks, I put on my hiking gear and decided to take a few of the off, ran trails heading north. I passed the bog near Route 504. The panorama was amazing as the sun glistened off the waters by the banks, which were covered in oak, cherry, and pine trees, trees that rose up the gentle slope of hills. I took in the fresh scent and decided after the hike, I'd do lunch then get in some fishing. I hadn't seen a soul up here yet outside of some cars on the road coming in and the park ranger who guided me to my camping lot. It was about 40 minutes into my hike when I had come across anything odd. I had taken pictures of some of the birds I saw and decided to make a mental note of the varieties I'd seen. There were warblers, teals, black ducks, Canadian geese, and other avian critters. As I crossed over a smaller bog path, I noticed a group of woodpeckers chasing a flying squirrel. Poor little critter, I said aloud to no one as I watched the aerial spat. Then a plane flew overhead, reminding me that no matter how far I go, civilization was. Um, what's that? I noted as I heard some crunching in the grass. I noticed the chittering of the critters had moved on as they continued their conflict. I knew black bears were native to this area, so I wanted to make sure there was a good bit of distance between me and it, just in case it decided to charge. I followed the noise of the crunching up the hill and into a nearby clearing. Moving slowly is not to startle the bear. Hell, it might not even be a bear, I thought, but deer or something else. It was neither. It was just another hiker like myself. Well, I guessed she was a hiker, but she didn't dress like one. It was a young black girl, probably late twenties, a few years older than myself, I thought. She had on a tank top with some bike shorts and sneakers. It was kind of odd, as it was unseasonably cool. It was probably around fifty degrees or so, maybe a little warmer, in the sunlight. She was carrying only one of those small backpack purses. She was very carefree as she walked, humming a tune and swinging the pack about as she played with the fauna. She walked to a grouping of stones and found a small tree stump and sat down. She gazed up at the sky and smiled. Damn, she was cute, I thought, as she looked about. Her hair was short and styled, high cheeks, nice pouty lips. With a fit, athletic body, maybe only a few inches shorter than me. She pulled the pack to the front and looked inside. I guess to make sure she had what she needed out here, like keys or mace or something. I thought it would be courteous to at least let her know I was out here so as not to startle her. But just as I decided to not come across as a creeper looking at a chick in the woods, I felt the air temperature just drop. I shook for a quick moment as a chill went down my spine. Who? Shit! 
I said aloud, but not loud enough for her to hear me as I shivered. Must have been a breeze or something, I said to myself, rubbing my arms. As I gathered myself, I noticed the sky was almost imperceptibly darker. I mean, the sun was still out. And the sky is mostly clear, but it was almost like looking at the world through barely tinted sunglasses, which I was not wearing. I started making my way to her, and then I noticed her left hand. She was holding up her index finger. It, it, it was pointed in my direction. Had she seen me? There was no way. I was in the tree land, covered in shadow, and making my way around the bushes. She probably heard me curse, and what the F? I cried as the chill returned with no breeze at all. I looked about frightened for some reason. I didn't know why. But I was scared as hell. I looked towards the girl. I had to warn her. But warn her of what? Me being scared shitless for no reason. Then I noticed her finger still up, but pointing directly at me, then wagging at me. Then wagging at me. Like, don't come here, stay put, stay where I was. Confused, I decided to see what. Holy ah! I whispered to myself as I looked at her. Behind her. Behind her. What the hell is that? I tried to scream, but my voice died out as my eyes went wide with terror. As she just sat there not seeing the thing behind her. I tried to run, but like my voice, my legs didn't want to work. I could only watch in horror as the creature slithered much like a snake as it approached her. It rose behind her, its form like a dark, wispy, ripped, overly large and long cloak. It was a cloak of floating darkness. The bottom and arms were just like shredded bed sheets draped over a corpse, as the only true feature on it was the bony, deer-like antlers on its hooded and skeletal face. Moss, grass, and other detritus dangled loosely from its antlers. The skeletal face was human, but overly large, and its mouth a gaping pit of darkness. As was its eyeless pits, a crack ran from its temple into the darkness of the hood. It reached for the girl as a pack dangled from her shoulder. No, it reached for the backpack, the shredded, handless hem of where its arm should be gingerly reached for it. I wet myself as I knew that thing would kill her, and she'd never even know it. I guess it was a blessing to die swiftly, but if it had seen me, I'd know how I would die. Death under a cloudless, sunny day, with the sounds of the woods to muffle my death cries, as the animals went about their days like this was normal. To my shock, the girl pulled the backpack over her shoulder and craned her head to look behind her. You remember how you got that crease on that bony face of yours, right? She said to it with little emotion. Ah, yes, it said, raising its sleeved arm to its head. You, Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia, assaulted me without provocation, I remember. You did try to suck the life from me, if I remember correctly. She said back to the thing as if they had some rivalry or something. Did you get the items per my request? The creature said as it floated to the front to face her as it towered over the sitting woman, the bottom of its smoke. Like forms weighed silently about a foot off the ground. But had it been touching the ground, it would probably still be at least ten feet tall. It glanced down at her. May I see it? To be sure it is what I asked for. The demonic specter hissed in its airy breath. The girl looked to the backpack and reached inside. I could feel my legs quivering as I was both fascinated and terrified at the sight before me. My brain desperately tried to understand this whole thing. A human girl is having a conversation with some ghostly monstrosity. It's sunny and cloudless, and the sounds of the forest went on as normal. I think I even heard another plane overhead as my nose took in the smell of my urine, and my weak knees marinated in the stuff, too shaken to do anything else. I watched on as the girl pulled something from the bag. It looked like a brass cup and a medallion. The creature hissed in pleasure as it rose above her, its arms fluttering like some damn bird before it settled down again. This what you mean? The girl said dangling the medallion and holding the brass cup before it. The creature shrunk towards the ground in an almost kneeling position. As it did so, the front of its ethereal body began to glow in a small circular pattern about the size of the medallion. Do you also have the other thing? It said excitedly. 
its antlered head moving forward, trying to look in the pack. She pulled it back and told it to. Take it easy. She told it annoyed at the thing's eagerness. How long has it been? She asked it as she pulled forth another cup and a small bottle or something. The creature rose up and back as the light in the medallion dimmed some. It looked as if it was in contemplation. What human year is this now? It asked. 2019 of the common era, she told it. 374 of your years since I lost that. It growled, pointing to the medallion and the brass cup. Name your fee and let's be on with it. It stated the eagerness overriding its common sense as its formless body shuddered in anticipation. I told you my fee when you made the request. That crack on the head knocked away some of your memory, she asked it, tapping her head. Are you serious? That was your fee? Not power or influence or money as you humans love so much? Not adoration or some silly bargain? It said to her almost incredulously, A story. A story, she stated with a wide grin on her face. A story, I said to myself. Why something so small? Why not something of significance? The creature asked her. I, too, was curious about this, because my job is to collect the history of as many things as I can. I'm also a sucker for a good story. Stories are significant. I know somewhere in that spectral skull of yours you've seen and done some shit. Just tell me one she said, holding up a finger. You are very curious for a human Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia, it replied to her. How long have you been around? She asked the thing. Thousands of your years. Why, tell me a story of something. Eight hundred, no, one thousand years back, she stated as she placed her elbows on her knees and cupped her face like a damn kid at camp around a campfire. She even had the silliest damn grin on her face. Who was she? How could she? That was she sit around that thing like it was normal. I hadn't realized it, but I found myself sitting also on a dry patch of the ground looking on intensely. I must be suffering from brain damage or something. Fear mixed with intrigue, mixed with intrigue, mixed with heightened curiosity. I, too, waited for the story of the thing. Very well, curious one. The story I will tell you is of a really stupid boy. In his equally stupid family, the creature began. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.